सेकेंड ओके वी आर लाइव इन फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड इवनिंग कॉल वन सेकेंड आई वेलकम यू ऑल फॉर दिस एस एस आई ग्लोबल आउटरीच प्रोग्राम एंड टूडे वी हैव अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग सेशन विथ बांग्लादेश स्पाइन सोसाइटी दिस इज अ टॉपिक इज ऑन थोराकोलम्बर फ्रैक्चर्स एंड फ्रॉम एसोसिएशन ऑफ स्पाइन सर्जेंट्स ऑफ इंडिया आई रिक्वेस्ट आवर पास प्रेसिडेंट डॉक्टर एच एस चाबरा सर टू वेलकम ऑल द फैकल्टीज एंड डेलीगेट्स hello good evening <clears throat> welcome to the assi global outreach program and um, we are privileged uh, in that we have the honor of uh, today collaborating with bangladesh spine society for this um, uh, program um, i'm sure uh, that we since we face uh, almost similar issues in our countries uh, this uh, will be a great uh, platform to discuss on uh, various uh, aspects of management of thoracolumbar fracture the common issues that we face uh, the opportunities that we have and how we can frame gu guidelines which would suit our um, uh, countries so with that uh, i would not keep you away from uh, this fantastic uh, session which has been planned uh, over to you uh, gururaj and uh, rishi thank you sir um i just would like to ask uh, dr shah alam president of bangladesh spine society to say few words and then we'll start the program uh, thank you guru uh, good evening uh, uh, chabra and other lands from india a uh, special thanks uh, guru and uh, his team for organizing uh, a joint uh, collaborative webinar with uh, bangladesh spine society and association association of spine surgeon of india and in their global outreach uh, program uh, it is a two uh, the uh, topic is a very pertinent thoracic lumbar fracture how we are dealing and india subcontinent with the same problem so i think these uh, uh, discussion will be very very helpful and also uh, it will guide all of us uh, how to deal and uh, when to change our uh, recent uh, advancement and the uh, modification of uh, recent ideas Uh, so uh, everything going to be discussed i think it will be very very helpful to everybody so with these few words uh, i again uh, thanks especially including me and my society and also a uh, guru because the guru worked there hard and also it was a postponed and shifted even that successfully we are going to start uh, so i think in future also it will be helpful and we will organize the same combined program that will be helpful for everybody thank you once again to everybody thank you thank you sir uh, so we'll start with the first uh, topic uh, that is from dr ajay shetty uh, he is the uh, past secretary and uh, chair of uh, uh, education committee assi uh, so he will be talking on timing of spine surgery in spinal cord injury what has changed uh, thank you guru can you hear me yes sir okay uh, good evening to all of you also my thanks to the assi and guru in especially for this invite my talk would be on surgical timing in traumatic spinal cord what is new we know that the spinal cord injury has got two mechanisms the primary mechanism which happens at the time of the accident which we cannot do anything about it basically by legislation what we can do to control the primary injury but what we are interested is basically the secondary mechanism of injury wherein there are different changes that is happening from the acute phase to the subacute phase to the intermediate and the chronic phase as you can see in this diagram the during these phases various phases there is a cell death demyelination damage to the architecture of the cord and there is restricted axonal regrowth what we are looking at is to how to limit this secondary mechanism of injury there various approach has been tried over the years what we do know now is that vasopressor support is important to maintain a mean blood pressure of greater than 90 mm of mercury since the spine does not have the capacity to auto regulate is important to maintain adequate oxygenation on the other hand we have tried various pharmacological agents like high dose methotrexate and we do now know that they are not that effective as it we thought 
it was earlier. What we can do from our side is basically a surgical management. The surgical management in patients with a spinal cord injury has got two purposes. Number one, the surgical aim is to realign the spinal column, re-establish the spinal stability, and to decompress the spinal cord. But there is also a biological aim to the surgery. That is, when we are doing this, doing the surgical stabilization, we, if you do it early, it may help to prevent the zone of injury and to improve the clinical outcomes. If you look at the PubMed search on early surgeries for spinal cord injury, there have been an increased literature in the last few years, probably with understanding that things like stem cells may not be beneficial at this stage. And hence, people are concentrating on something what they can do more, much more effectively. The earlier uh, literature on early surgery meant less than 72 hours. But if you look at the literature, they say there is no difference in outcome between less than 72 hours and greater than 72 hours. But what really made the change is the famous STASIS trial, which looked at 24 hours outcome. And these studies have shown very effectively that if you operate less than 24 hours, definitely there is a different and improved outcome. And that came out with a call saying that time is fine. And as the earlier you operate, there is a better chance of improvement in the neurological conditions. And this is the outcome in stasis trial, which shows a moderate degree of improvement. Therefore, early surgeries is beneficial in cervical spinal cord injury and is shown by multiple surgeries and much more beneficial in incomplete spinal cord injuries. And this has been shown by multiple other publications which followed the stasis trial. What are the things I would like to discuss? Does the level of injury affect the outcome? I mean, whether it matters, like early surgery has got a better outcome in cervical, thoracic, and thoracolumbar. If you look at the published literature up till the last few years, it is well known that improvement happens in early surgery in the cervical spine. But probably no major improvement happens in the thoracolumbar patient. But this is a recent publication which came out of uh, Iran which showed that early surgery group in thoracolumbar fracture also can have a benefit in terms of improvement in neurological outcome and also in terms of early discharge from the hospital. Therefore, what is the role of early surgery in complete versus incomplete spinal cord injury? I mean, as per the published literature so far, the benefit is mainly in Asia incomplete spinal cord injury, whereas in patients with complete spinal cord injury, there is no significant improvement in neurological outcome. And therefore, that puts the question, what do you mean by early? How early we should consider? We, we know that less than 24 hours, there is a definitive improvement. But what about less than 12 hours, less than 8 hours, less than 4 hours? And that's what is called as, as ultra-early threshold surgeries. People have looked at surgeries less than 8, eight hours, and they found that there is a good improvement at 6 months follow-up in patients who have been operated at less than eight years. But what is interesting is that in this ultra early group, if you see the change from Asia A to Asia B, R to C and D is also possible. Therefore, what this extremely ultra early surgery has shown is that it benefits not only incomplete spinal cord injury, it could also benefit patients with complete spinal cord injury and also, it helps in decreasing the length of stay. This is one of our case examples. The patient came in within one hour. We were able to operate within two hours. And he improved from a grade A to D over a period of four weeks. And I would say that I had operated around five to six patients as early as possible at less than six hours. And four of them had done extremely well. And this is what various meta-analysis has shown. People have looked at ultra, ultra shorter, less than four hours, but they have shown that there is no difference in outcome between less than four hours to less than eight hours. And also one more important thing that matters is the intramedullary lesion length. If the lesion length of the cord is more than two or three vertebras, it's relatively longer, then the outcome could be poorer. Okay, what about in central cord syndrome? Again, in central cord syndrome, there is evidence to show that early surgery 
improves the outcome in terms of function of the hand, the paresthesias that tend to happen in central cord syndrome patients. Therefore, earlier is better even in patients with acute central cord syndrome. But as we all know, early surgery cannot be achieved in majority of your centers because of the facilities of transportation and the expertise of availability of surgeon all the time. And therefore, what is practical in majority of the centers worldwide is less than 24 hours. But whenever it's possible, it's better to operate a spinal cord injured patient as early as they come to realign the spine, to decompress and stabilize so that the chances of improvement is better. To conclude, earlier is better. Less than 8 to 12 hours is what we should look for. Better results in cervical, better results in, in incomplete injury, and better results also in central cord syndrome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. I, after the uh, session, we'll have a time for question and answers. Okay. Sure. Uh, leave it for that. And uh, now I welcome uh, Dr. H. S. Chabra, sir, President, uh, past President of uh, Association of Spine Surgeons of India, uh, to give his talk on stem cell uh, in spinal cord injury. Are we yet there? What to you, sir? Uh, sir, Thank you, uh, Dr. Guru Raj. After a wonderful talk by Dr. Ajoy Shetty, uh, I'll be covering this uh, controversial topic, uh, just trying to throw light on where we are with regard to stem cell uh, therapy or cellular therapies with regard to spinal cord injury. Every now and then, you keep getting such uh, publications in the media uh, where uh, tall claims are made about uh, recovery after stem cell therapy for spinal cord injury. In our country also, there have been various claims and there is still uh, stem cell therapy or so-called stem cell therapy being practiced in different parts of the country. However, when you look at stalwarts, uh, whether they are from US or whether they were from US or Canada or India, who despite all resources continue to be on the wheelchair, uh, that makes you wonder, are we actually there yet? So, uh, to look into why the confusion is, uh, we need to understand the pathology, review cellular therapies, analyze the confounding variables, and try to come to a conclusion. Uh, the myelinated fiber tracts of the adult CNS have a complex and regular arrangement of uh, three types of glial cells. When a tract is damaged, the cut axons produce local sprouts at the site of injury. But even with minimal disturbance to the tract line framework, the sprouts uh, do not re-enter into the distal part of the tract. So this has been the main challenge uh, which we have faced in regenerative therapies. So the cell-based approaches to treat spinal cord injury uh, can be grouped into replacement cell therapy or regenerative cell therapy. The uh, objectives of replacement cell therapy are replacement of functional neuronal and glial cells with the aim to regenerate axons and myelination of regenerated axons. So uh, methods used in replacement cell therapy have been um, several. Um, uh, the stem cells from xenografts have been used, embryonic and fetal stem cells, umbilical cord blood stem cells, and adult stem cells have been used. Let's look at them one by one. Um, porcine stem cells and embryonic stem cells uh, have been used, but results have not uh, been published. Um, human fetal uh, spinal cord uh, cells have been used um, in trials. Only safety of the procedure could be established and uh, survival of the graft in the host could not be demonstrated. And this is again one of the main challenges as to whether the cells survive or not. Uh, then um, this Korean trial, we are all aware, even though there were tall claims, uh, the researchers were put to disrepute later as it came out. Uh, adult neural stem cells uh, have been also used, um, uh, but uh, these have been mainly preclinical trials. No clinical trials have been done. And with adult marrow stem cells, autologous, intravenous, intramedullary, 
or intraspinal injections have been done. And uh, this has been um, uh, uh, studied a lot. There have been clinical trials also. We also did a study on autologous bone marrow uh, stem cell transplantation in acute spinal cord injury. And um, we could conclude only that it is relatively safe and feasible, uh, but uh, no efficacy could be demonstrated. So embryonic stem cell therapy has various advantages. Uh, they are pluripotent cells. Uh, they do not have the potential to develop into adult human beings. They can be transplanted after differentiating stem cells in vitro to the required precursor cell type. But there are risks of immunological rejection and uh, risks of tumor or teratoma formation, risk of mutations, dedifferentiation, and transdifferentiation, and risk of infections, non viability, mutation in stem cells uh, have been there. Adult stem cell uh, uh, stem cells may be autologous or allergenic. There is low risk of uh, immune rejection, so no requirement of immunosuppression is there. There is no risk of tumor or teratoma formation as would be there with embryonic stem cells. And there are no major ethical issues as are there with embryonic stem cells. However, they have a limited capacity for self-renewal and differentiation when compared to embryonic stem cells. And you can harvest not a lot of cells uh, as compared to the embryonic stem cell therapy. The greatest challenge in stem cell research has been to uncover the extracellular and intracellular mechanisms that determine and control the self-renewal and differentiation properties of the stem cell in physiological as well as host environment. Hence, preclinical and clinical studies with stem cells are still inconclusive, even though we have a fair um, uh, outcome with preclinical studies. Uh, regenerative cell therapies have the objective to achieve axonal elongation and regrowth through the adult CNS and to restore myelin around spared and primarily demyelinated axons. And uh, there are various methods which have been used. We'll cover them one by one. Um, there have been clinical trials using peripheral nerve grafts, uh, and um, uh, uh, though efficacy could not be demonstrated with them, even though they have been used with the, from a long time. Schwann cell transplants... Uh, Increased sprouting in the corticospinal tract, but very few sprouts entered the distal tract, so there were no uh, uh, efficacy demonstrated. Activated macrophages also, uh, there were phase one and phase two trials, but unfortunately, they have not been uh, reported as yet in the literature. So the major problems in uh, regenerative therapy for spinal cord injury has been that the exon sprouts were reluctant to leave the Schwann cell environment of the transplant and re-enter the glial environment of the distal corticospinal tract. Olfactory and sheathing glial cells have been uh, studied also vastly because of continuous physiological mechanism of regeneration and reconnection occurring between the peripheral nervous system and central nervous system, especially uh, in the olfactory region. And um, so it was thought that if you could uh, uh, take the whole uh, olfactory mucosal uh, uh, muco uh, olfactory mucosa from the region and transplant that, it may recreate the same environment and you may have good results. This is the only example in the body where the peripheral nervous system uh, 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 goes into the central nervous system. So Carlos Lima uh, published this uh, study uh, claiming good results with auto autologous uh, olfactory mucosal autograft. And um, uh, there were a lot of um, patients who came even from the U.S. to get undergo this treatment. But when we did the same study properly planned, uh, observed by an international steering committee and under the aegis of the ICMR, um, controlling all uh, confounding factors, we could demonstrate that it is only safe and feasible, but we could not uh, uh, demonstrate any efficacy of this procedure. So uh, there have been, um, uh, even though there has been preclinical evidence of uh, usefulness of cellular therapies or stem cell therapy, 
there have not been many uh, <laughs> clinical studies and none of them have been able to uh, demonstrate any efficacy in this regard. And uh, our uh, uh, literature review also demonstrated in this regard. Uh, so the problem is that the results are too fast for regeneration as claimed by the people. Therefore, the mechanism for early recovery is not known and nobody has been able to exactly tell how uh, their um, uh, transplant has worked. However, the claims of success through the media about spinal cord injury management with cellular therapy have not been backed by trials. And uh, this causes a lot of um, uh, stress on the patients and they do not go into um, uh, the proper established standard of care that is rehabilitation treatment. If you look at um, uh, the various factors which discriminate patient outcomes, there are plenty and it only points out that there is a need for a proper clinical trials which are well conducted. We know that there is a natural progression of SCI in all incomplete cases. Also in complete cases, they may have recovery in the zone of partial preservation and that this recovery could continue even up to 400 days after the injury. And we also know about the subject bias, the placebo effect, which may confound the outcomes, the observer bias, which may confound the outcomes. And there may be uh, 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 improvement because of uh, the plasticity of spinal cord, which gets harnessed by the augmented physical therapy after a trial. And we also know that there can be effects of delayed decompression. So, as I talked about, uh, the patients get affected uh, and do not pursue the standard of care. And um, uh, we also are aware about the adverse effects of cellular therapies, which may be there. There are plenty, but there are also autoimmune effects, which may uh, also prevent any subsequent successful therapy, which may come. Uh, so, it may prevent the patient from reaping the benefits of that. And so there have been various concerns about stem cell uh, therapy being uh, practiced without proper regulations. And our position statement pointed out the need for coming out with regulations to control unethical practices in this regard. And we know that there are proper documented ways in which such trials can be practiced the guidelines for the conduct of clinical trials for spinal cord injury are published and a good trial needs to follow these. So if we were to look into the carry home message, the list of experimental therapies that have been developed in animal models to improve functional outcomes after SCI is extensive. Though preclinical trials have shown a good potential for cellular therapies in SCI, there is no documentary proof that any form of cellular therapy has a definite role in management of human SCI. The adverse <laughs> effects of many such therapies are well documented. Thus, there is a need to conduct proper clinical trials. Some early stage SCI clinical trials have recently been started. However, some experimental therapies have been introduced into clinical practice without a clinical trial, trial being completed. Undue hype by the media and claims by professionals have a profound psychological effect on the spinal cord injured and interferes in the rehabilitation and this should uh, definitely be curtailed. I thank you for your patience and would be happy to answer any questions subsequently. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, giving that elaborative talk on uh, stem cells. And most of it <clears throat> is new for uh, most of us uh, here. And uh, thanks for that. Uh, so we'll move on to the next talk uh, by a president of Bangladesh Spine Society, that is uh, Dr. Shah Alam. So, sir, you're going to talk on do all spinal injuries need decompression or is there any role of decompression in spinal cord injury? Uh, thank you, Guru and your team. Uh, Guru, can you see me? Yes, sir. We can. We can see. We can. But then uh, put it on a slideshow. Slideshow. Yes, no borrow that. Borrow that. Slash. It's it's not on slide. So you have we have to hide the next slide or the notes. Uh, I think sir, you have to log off and log in. If it doesn't happen, this you have to log off and log in, sir. No, no. I think that's fine. If you. Uh, uh, 
if no. you from my side if it you... is uh, not a guru yes sir i'm not sure our side way when i do but it comes all of you i don't know on <laughs> top so on top you... if you can remove uh, show task bar show uh, remove show task bar and uh, then just yeah. click on show task bar and then it will come like that right. on the left side show task bar the... yeah now click on the yes. slide show the slide show down down sir okay, okay. Down. slide show down there yes yeah 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 no no press uh, slide show down it comes this size but if you unless you log off and log in this will not solve okay this log off right. completely you mean and you log off from zoom and log in back or oh, unshare and unshare and share Guru, let it let sir continue okay uh, so uh, dr shalam you can go yeah. back to that your powerpoint mode and then we can continue on that slide okay. not not this the show task bar again yeah we can we can maybe go on this screen okay should i should i proceed yes sir okay uh, thank you uh, guru and your team and also thanks to assi uh, by the collaboration with the bangladesh farm society so my talk uh, on the number trauma in general, but mostly my concentration to all spinal injuries need uh, decompression. So this is the one of the scenario the burst fracture having the I mean the whole canal is uh, compromised and a lot of fragments. So I will share the our experience after the discussion of all presenter and case presentations. What would be the I mean the classification and what would be the treatment and what level of physician compression and decompression or not. But uh, this is uh, my workplace where I'm working and it's a collaboration of the India and uh, Bangladesh. So what is the principle of decision making in bar structure of the thoracolumbar and uh, lumbar spine? The first is the decompression of the neural tissue and stabilization and fusion. So how to, uh, I mean, the decompress, the proposed surgical treatment strategies are maybe the direct or indirect. So when we do the indirect, uh, I mean, the decompression by uh, doing the ligament taxis, and when we do the direct, maybe the transpedicular decompression, or we can remove the whole fragments, lamina, lamina and the whole, I mean, the fragment that compressing, so we can uh, decompress the canal as well as the foramen. So what is the necessity of direct decompression of thoracolumbar junction or bar structure with neurological compromises? If we see the literature, it is a seen that in many literature, basically there is no differences in outcome when direct decompression or ligament taxes. Again, if we see the other, uh, I mean the paper, they have shown that the clinical results of posterior stabilization without decompression for thoracolumbar bar structure, is a decompression necessary? And it is seen that the no decompression in direct or indirect or even in the presence of the reverse cortical signs, there is no difference. So when it is the neurologically, I mean the deficit, the direct association with the severity of the initial canal damage and neurological damage, still it is unknown. That's why the question comes, the, again, the, is there any correlation between the neurological deficit and spinal canal compromises? There is a data analysis of 198 patients with thoracolumbar and lumbar fracture. It is said that, yes, there is a positive correlation between the spinal canal compromise and the severity of incomplete neurological deficit. But it is still unexplained that, unable to explain why the Frankel E patients and Frankel A patients are presented with similar narrowing of the spinal canal. That's why the neurological injury in thoracolumbar bar spectrum which arises, so, so no significant correlation between bony or canal disruption of that or with neurological deficit. But of course, there is a significant correlation between the energy of the injury and subsequent the neurological status. That means that every sense to deterioration, if the magnitude of trauma is very high, the initially if it occurs. So how the spontaneous canal remodeling occurs? If we see here, there is a provision that the progressive remodeling occurs during the first 12 months after injury. Even the retropause bone that is shrank about one third of the initial size within 12 months. If we see these uh, 
I mean, the X, uh, I mean, the axial section of CT scan, the immediately after injury and two weeks after injury and 12 months, there is a huge, I mean, the recanalization of the canal and the bony fragments in the canal usually do not represent the continuation or the continuing with the progressive I mean, the neurological deficit or the compressive force working over the spinal cord or not. So the neurological starts when neurological recovery starts. It is seen that it starts even the before surgery. So immediately after, I mean, the injury, naturally it occurs, it starts or it tries to recover the neurological function. So the surgical canal clearance does not affect the extent of the neurological deficit. It is a there's a lot of paper supporting that. So recovery of the bladder function and other is a little bit different. It is dependent on the sensory disturbance of the perianal area at the time of injury. But it is totally independent of the treatment method because the treatment, whatever the way we do, and initial the sensory deficit if it is, so there is some differences. That's why the no correlation between the canal compromise and neurological deficit at the time of injury. But the neurological recovery and spinal canal compromise at the time of injury, there is some correlation. So, but what do we do in our perspective? Basically, we do the direct decompression when, when there is a reverse cortical sign and when there is the laminar split sign, or if the motor deficit is three or more than three, or less than three, I so more than three, then we go for the direct decompression. Again, what is the reverse cortical sign? All of you know that this is the fragment coming from the posterior wall and when it is flipped 180 degree or more than 180 degree with the cancellous surface and facing the canal. In that case, ligamentaxis is basically is a contraindicated as because the all PLL is a rupture. That's why there is no issue if we do the ligamentaxis. But there is other, uh, I mean the uh, uh, sign that is the pseudo reverse cortical sign. It means when this rotation is less than 90 degree not 180 degree. In that case, there is some compromise, but uh, it is not like that of your uh, reverse cortical sign. But here, the ligament taxis has some growth because to some extent, the PLL is intact. For an example, this is the first one I've seen, shown this. If we see that after, uh, I mean, the reduction and uh, the stabilization without any decompression, if we see the initial the, uh, I mean, the sagittal section here, the canal totally was compromised. But when you see here, uh, the canal is uh, almost uh, the good spaces there. And uh, uh, that is the issue that no need to do all the time, uh, I mean, the decompression. So another patient having with the Asia C, L1 bar fracture. This is a before surgery X-ray and a CT scan, and also MRI, and the last one is the X-ray, the good, I mean, the height regaining and uh, uh, without, uh, I mean, the decompression, thus stabilization alone and decompression access was done. Another patient, the ACID neurology, the bar spectra, if we see uh, that there's the 20 degree kyphotic angle and without any decompression, when we uh, stabilized posteriorly and we did the ligamentary axis and the good regaining of, uh, I mean, the um, uh, regaining and the, only the few degrees of kyphotic deformity is there. Uh, this is uh, the, another patient with the Asia T, only few degrees uh, existing the kyphosis initially was 28 degree, and this is the 10 degree. And if we see this uh, uh, young boy that totally has uh, regained his uh, neurological function and can work, uh, and uh, can stand uh, and uh, work. Uh, and, uh, but uh, we didn't do any sort of the posterior decompression only, but no, uh, only stabilization, no neurological, uh, I mean, the no decompression was done. This is uh, another patient uh, D, uh, in the junction of the D12 and L1, the Asia C. Uh, we did uh, the posterior surgery and uh, also we didn't uh, decompress, just only stabilize. And uh, this is, uh, I mean, the post of a CT scan. And another patient, uh, this is the partial fracture at D11 and D12, uh, Asia D. So we didn't do any decompression, only the stabilization. And we did it uh, by, I mean, the MIS technique, so no need to open. The other patient, uh, the L1 box fracture, Asia D injury, and it was stabilized only by doing uh, the posterior stabilization, no decompression. So we see that the, in our series, the 49 patient we did, 
uh, and the award series was starting from January 2018 to September 2003, and it was done in the one spine and orthopedic hospital. And uh, the injury starting was of five to 10, 20 days, and minimum follow up was like three months. So, in our series, we've seen that the 25 patients regained the neurology at the first follow up time, and the mean P operative kyphotic deformity was about 27, and it was G2Z at 10. And ODI improved up from a P operative score 67 points to, to the final, the 25. So, the final, we like to say that the, when there is no deficit, no decompression. Ligament taxis can be done in most cases and is as effective as direct decompression. So the careful patient selection might avoid the direct decompression as well as save the operating time. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shalom. Uh, now the uh, session is open for uh, discussion. Uh, do you have any questions? Uh, Dr. Guru? Yeah, yes, Dr. Anjit. Yeah, can I have a, uh, have a question to uh, Dr. Ajay Shetty, sir? Sir, yeah. uh, you said about the ultra short window of uh, surgery and yeah. uh, advantage where you know people you noticed a difference in the Asia grade. So, in advocating ultra short window of surgery, aren't you operating on more patients with spinal shock? Yeah, that's also a fact because you might consider saying that a patient with a spinal shock is going to improve. But having said that, how many patients with Asia A, you see them recover uh, without doing intervention? If you have to compare that group of people with, with the operation within 8 hours or without uh, greater than 8 hours. It's always a point that when you are operating with less than 12 hours, you might say that probably the patient were in spinal shock, they might have recovered. That's always a point. I mean, we cannot 100% say no. <laughs> Yes, sir. So probably in a type C, it doesn't make a difference. You know that it is seldom important. So in 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 a in a A three or in a or a A four, you know, in a burst situation where we really so at those situations you give importance to the structural damage than the cord yes. injury, right? It's basically uh, better in cervical, thoracic. Whenever there is a AO type C injury, the disruption is so much they are less likely to improve. Basically, in situation where there is a static or a dynamic ongoing compression, it could be beneficial. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, Chabra, sir. Yeah, I would only try to carry it forward from what Ranjit has mentioned. If we look into the literature, uh, Middendorp had written a letter to the editor, to the Spine Journal, and had pointed out various shortcomings uh, of the Staskis trial and uh, had... Um, uh, so if you uh, if you would talk to Mr. Masri or Middendorf, they will talk about how the data has been misinterpreted. Also, because um, um, uh, as Ranjit mentioned, the real outcome uh, gets known at 48 hours since the injury. So many people who are claimed to be Asia A may not actually be AIS A. Because yes. uh, at 48 hours since the injury, they will be A, S, B, or C. So um, uh, today, even uh, even today, that debate continues. Even in the recent ISICON, uh, there was a pitched fight between Mr. Masri and my, Dr. Michael Felix. And we'll be coming out with a, a virtual special issue in JCOT, uh, which will cover... Uh, uh, the conservative versus surgical management of uh, vertebral fractures. So uh, there are claims, but there are counterclaims as well, and we can't ignore them as well. Uh, so sir, I, I just heard, I will just add one sentence. I agree with uh, Dr. Chabra. What I have heard is that they came out with the STASIS trial basically because uh, majority of these uh, polytrauma centers, the government was trying to shut down it, mm -hmm. and they had to show evidence that there is a benefit of operating early. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always in the US, when it comes out from Northern America, you have to be very cautious. How do, how do you interpret that? Okay. Also, Ajoy, we have to see that not many centers in India may have the same facilities of anesthetic and perioperative management as centers in developed countries have. And we know that if we do not um, manage the patients well during surgery, it may adversely affect the outcomes. It may be, yes. So, I have a question to Dr. Ojo Shetty, sir. Sure. Can I ask? 
Yep. So, so in our perspective, we have observed in particularly complete cervical spine injury. Suppose the patient in our perspective, uh, a patient come to late. So maybe a case of six, seven dislocation or like that. As we have observed that maybe whenever the patient respiratory center is involved, although it is a six, seven, suppose uh, after injury time is, if it is a day fourth or day fifth, at that time, patient has respiratory distress, severe respiratory distress. So in that scenario, do you advocate to operate this patient? And what is the what will be the outcome of this patient? And another thing is that even a patient is normal neurologist, when I mean the ACIA initially is okay, but what we actually observe just after operation, maybe fourth or fifth postoperative day, patient has suddenly deteriorated. So what is the reason behind that? And what is your Basically, observation? Uh, for the question number one, is there any benefit in operating somebody who comes after four days with respiratory distress? Usually, yes. the yes. benefit is very, very less. I mean, especially yes. in a country like ours, the expenditure the patient has to incur, he will go on a ventilator. The outcome is really poor. But yes. for us, we can't make the decision. We have to discuss with the patient, the family members, the benefits, pros and cons. And usually what happens is that the family members feel that they have to do what is right. And uh, they usually, I mean, pressurize us to do a surgery. The outcome may be yeah. poor. Coming yes. to the fact why some patients deteriorate is probably the edema. Post-intervention, there could be an increase in the edema, which can or which can extend proximally, might involve the... Ascending the hematoma. Could be yeah. ascending hematoma. Sorry. Yes. Ascending edema. Hematoma. So I have a question to Chabra, sir. Sir, you gave the current statement that as of now, stem cell therapy is in a research stage. We cannot advocate it to patients for a charge or for a money because it is still experimental. So as a surgeon, is there anything which I could take care when I operate so that a future stem cell therapy is possible in that patient? Any surgical things which I should take care when I operate a patient of thoracic lumbar trauma or a cervical spine trauma? So that is also a difficult question to answer because um, if we say do a decompression so that you have a patent canal so that any subsequent um, uh, uh, successful therapy, you have a patent canal there. But uh, the advocates against this would say that uh, there is remodeling which can happen as also Dr. Shah Alam pointed that out. And most of uh, this compression gets resolved with time. But um, of course, uh, we can reduce the chance of syrinx. So whether direct or indirect decompression, if we can achieve that, um, most of the cases you can achieve indirect decompression. And that is what we try to achieve in this patient so that uh, subsequently uh, they it is possible uh, uh, that they get the advantages of any successful therapy that may come. Um, other than that, uh, I am uh, I I uh, am not aware because uh, of any other surgical interventions which may help in a successful therapy subsequently. Um, uh, Carlos Lima used to decompress uh, even uh, the cord uh, by opening the dura and removing any adhesions. But as we found out subsequently, it can be counterproductive as well. Sabra, can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. Sabra, sure. can you hear me? Uh, I have one query to you. One thing is that so, uh, in your observation, when you are using uh, stem cells, say the cervical dorsal, mm -hmm. upper dorsal, lower dorsal, is there any, I mean, the correlation that, that which part of the spinal cord response responded to move as a better by putting the, the stem cell? I can answer that in um, you the you can document the outcomes better in a cervical spine injury because even if there is one root recovery you can demonstrate that whereas in a thoracic thoracolumbar or thoracic level uh, injury you have to have recovery at multiple levels before you can document so we are trying to come out with objective uh, outcome assessments uh, so that we can document recovery through EMG and other methods. There's an indo study which is going on at the moment uh, in which we are participating, which which uh, may come out with this. But the con there is that um, 
the potential harmful effects of uh, intervening in the cervical spine are far more than in a thoracic spine. So we need to draw a fine balance when we choose which areas of the spine we go. Generally, it is recommended that we should try first in the thoracic spine because the potential to harm there is much less than in the cervical spine. Thank and you. also in an era where there are other better experimental techniques which are available to give benefit to the patient, like epidural stimulation. So um, I would uh, uh, say it may be totally unethical to put the patients to, I would not say therapy, I would say stem cell transplantation, uh, uh, other than in a proper trial where you are more positive about the outcomes uh, which have been documented in a preclinical study. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, for want of time, last question from Dr. Shahidul Islam, and then we'll move on to case discussion. Thank you very much, Guru, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Shalom, President of Bangladesh Spine Society, for your brilliant presentations. What message you want to give when there is a lamina split sign for direct and indirect decompression? For our juniors. Yeah, the linear speed sign and reverse cortical sign, when there is that, then we advocate for decompression and stabilization. It means that only stabilization is sufficient when there is no, I mean, the laminar split sign, there is no cortical, uh, reverse cortical sign, or even pseudo uh, cortical sign. In that case, only stabilization is okay. So when these are the signs, or with a neurological deficit, then in that case, definitely will do decompression. Okay, thank you. Uh, so next, we'll move on to case discussions. Uh, if all the faculties agree, there was a, a slight change in the plan uh, because uh, as uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Ranjit, had put it on the group. Uh, so we'll uh, start with the case, which is uh, without neurological deficits. Um, so... That will be presented by Dr. Jonaid. Uh, if everybody agrees, we'll take that case first and then we'll move on to other um, more severe fractures. Okay. So, okay. okay. so Dr. Jonaid, can we start with your case discussion, please? Dr. Jonaid, are you there? If... Okay, so I think, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. go on. Okay. Okay, can we have slide show? Yes, yes. Let me know. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, am I audible? Yes. So, thank you, Dr. Guru. So, as it is a thoracolumbar session, so we will start our case. So, so basically, this is my case and I have nothing to disclose. So, this is a patient with 30 years female. She is a housewife with a history of fall. And she presented after, she presented with severe low back pain two days after injury to the emergency department and she has got admitted in spine unit of our hospital and in examination it seems that her neurology is almost normal and there is no bowel bladder involvement so things is that there is a already 48 hours since injury with a history of fall with almost with normal neurology and intact bowel bladder involvement so this is the x-ray of the patient so anybody from the panel comment on this um so uh, dr uh, sahil dr sahil can we have in your comment please can i hear you should go ahead. Okay, so Jonaid. Uh, yes, yes. From this, so I know, and I kind of think that there's a bug. Yeah, there's 
goes to a A3 or a A4 for me. So okay. I, I need to have uh, uh, further imaging. I need CT and MRI to prioritize this. Okay, fine. But it looks more like a translational injury to speak. So this is the CT scan. You can see th see that. So only the uh, I mean the lumbar tree fracture with severe combination with posterior bend is almost intact. So it's A four for me. This A four. A four, yes, because yes. there is the both end plate fracture. You can see here, right? And there is also the posterior fracture as well as the retropulsion of the canal. And this is the MRI. You can see that the thecal sac is, I mean, the indentation with compressed by the, by the fragments. So this patient, although there is a severe compression, but fortunately, she has intact neurology. So based on this CT, X-ray, and MRI, what to do? So, should we treat it conservative or should we treat it by operation? Dr. Anwar? Dr. Anwar? Yes, she has yes, a no Dr. Guru. Yeah. Yes, Guru. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as it is a uh, four type of fracture and uh, vertebral uh, height is not maintained properly, uh, definitely I should go for the uh, decompression by uh, corfectomy and uh, uh, fusion by mesh case with bone graft with stabilization uh, from the uh, pedicle screw and uh, rod. I think that will be better. So is there oh. anybody differ? Yeah, uh, so I differ. Yeah, I'll yeah. Go, go on. I'll do posterior. Mm -hmm. I'll do posterior. I'll do, I'll go uh, two about two below screws and one index screw and I'll give time to heal. Because this in this, I just want to stabilize the spine. I don't want decompression because her neurology is normal. Normal. Okay. I just want to treat the stability, the, the bony instability. I'll just do a posterior surgery. I'll not touch anterior now. Telling the patient that if it fails in future, I'll go anterior anytime. She's a young lady. I don't want to violate her abdomen. And so, I, 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 I want to... Also, I, can say, I, can say, say, posterior ligamentous complex is okay. So I am in favor only the posterior stabilization. Okay, Dr. Chavra. Yeah, uh, I believe this is a young lady, right? Correct me if I got it wrong. It's a thirty-year-old lady, sir. Right, <laughs> and uh, we in a in an era where we talk about sagittal balance, this is a lying down X-ray, right, or an MRI, right? Um, if we uh, were ever to get a standing X-ray, there would be gross, uh, uh, the sagittal balance would be grossly affected. Two, uh, there is, um, uh, we can see that uh, uh, at least two of the uh, lines, the anterior vertebral and the posterior vertebral line are grossly affected. And I suspect that the post, uh, the interspinous line would be also affected. So uh, I, I uh, think this is a three column injury. Yes. I would not go two column two above and two below because I want to preserve segments. So I okay. would uh, uh, go one level above, one level below, put a screw on one side in the affected vertebra, a short screw. From the other side, I will, uh, from posterior only, do a corpect me, partial corpect me, and put in a cage in front. And uh, 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 in my experience, that uh, should be the that should promise a good outcome in this young lady. So let me correct myself. I meant two screws above, two screws below. One segment above, fine, one fine, segment fine. Fine. index and screw. Also the fragment, the index screw. Index screw, yes. If we were to put both the index screws and correct this deformity, then they are likely to fail because uh, uh, it will open up, right? And a lot of stress will come on the implant. So as soon as you correct that. So you need to put an anterior support, which you can put from one side, not with the intention of decompression, but with the intention of putting... Give it. And at this level, doing that is very easy because um, you have only the corda equina there and there are very yes. less chances of injury. You can easily do it from behind. Uh, uh, so so if, if, if I may ask, uh, sir, uh, in this patient, like in this patient, what will be our 
aim ultimately what we want to achieve at the end of our surgery a stable spine with a long term sagittal balance being maintained because oh. we want to prevent late complications of pain in this patient because late intervention will be much more complicated and at this moment we have an unstable spine where the sagittal balance can be corrected very easily okay uh, dr ajay um, in, i know in your center uh, you routinely take out uh, implants after uh, some time so would you differ uh, i i do not not always Yes, sir. I do not uh, remove the implant. Most of the patients who have these fractures are very poor. Even if you suggest, they would not come back. Yeah. But in the situation, sometimes when we need to put a long segment in the lumbar spine, after maybe around nine to ten months, I would prefer to do the I mean, removal so that the mobility at the other ends could be there. Uh, sir, not always. Sir, so when when you plan to remove, already you have planned to remove the implants. Will your plan change in such kind of patients? Not in this patient. This patient is the one we definitely need to have a better stability and fusion. Okay. Amount, even if when you look at the X-ray, you can realize the kyphosis is greater than twenty-five to thirty degrees. That usually implies, yeah. irrespective yeah. of whatever you see in the X-ray, CT, and MR, that the PLC has to be disrupted. I mean, there is a significant injury for this patient. Yes. I mean, we need something which will allow fusion to happen, either by a combined approach. Or by a posterior approach, and I would prefer to leave the implant. So, okay. so in that particular case, so you would fix only from posterior, right? Yeah, I would prefer a posterior approach, like how Ranjit said. So, so <clears throat> no corpectomy or like that. So, it's an so approach. I'm not saying one is superior over the other. It depends upon one new position the patient prone, how how your uh, whatever the body looks like. And yeah. whether you'll be able to put the screw, a lot of factors you need to take into consideration. Okay, okay, okay. Ajay, do you suggest any anterior support for this patient? Mm -hmm. No. Usually we do not, but uh, I know Dr. Chabra has published a publication in, I think, Global Spine Journal with regards to a uh, fusion which he described for lumbar fractures. I think this is a fresh case, no neurological deficit, posterior ligamentous complex is okay. When we'll put in position, no. And no. will, uh, I mean, the, we gain something. And in that case, anterior support, uh, in our perspective, we don't do, we all do. They don't remodel. And no. Yeah, it in remodels time. automatically because, and also, this is in the not, uh, I mean, the third level, uh, in the lower level. So there is a space event, and uh, still there is a chance to remodel it. Okay. Uh, so, no. Juna, can we go ahead and see what you did? Yes, yes. Just a minute. So, in our perspective, what I actually did, so we did the, the as it is a lumbar vertebra, mm -hmm. so we want to preserve the motion segment mm -hmm. and the fracture as it is a severely comminuted. Okay. So I think if I do the posterior, uh, maybe one level or two level, ultimately this may be chances of failure because there are lots of literature, sub, I mean, the suggesting that. Only posterior can fail these sorts of cases. So what yes. we actually did, we do, did all from posterior, did corpectomy, uh, putting a case with anterior reconstruction. And this is the, uh, I mean, the paroperative picture as you have seen, and this is the final outcome. And patient is ultimately very well. And since till my for it's uh, two or two years already is full up and see it seems she's Good, quite okay. Guru, Guru, yes, sir. Guru, I think this is the good judgment uh, by the Dr. Shuri Muhammad Janayat because uh, the anterior column support was very minimum. Mm. And the body was fragmented and multi segmented. So, that yes. in that position, if you don't put in the start support from the anterior or middle column, then uh, further recapitulation will be happen if whenever it uh, fixes from the posterior, whatever may be the thing for prevention okay. of this kyphosis. Definitely go for uh, for yes. the uh, startup to maintain the lordosis of the lumbar spine. Uh, Dr. Janath, can I ask a question to you? Uh, sure. sure. Uh, I have a question. So uh, my argument to this is that I can do the same procedure with the index screw. And yes. if my surgery, if it fails late, I mean the anterior column fails, I can do the surgery any time later. I can go from the same back itself. So what do I what do I lose you know, by giving her a chance to naturally remodel? And probably late down the lane, if it I see the column is 
going for kyphosis or screws loosening i can go in and do the same thing for the back itself so i am totally agree with you but the problem is that in our perspective suppose the doing surgery two times sometimes it is not allowed by the patient man she he or she may be it, it is not feasible for his or him to bear he, the expenses of the surgery he, or sir, he will not be agreed she or he will not be agreed that's for the why, that's why if we want to a very rigid construct and ultimately here with a on anterior support with a very good um, a strong 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 and rigid construct and with a very good outcome that's okay. Okay, so the last comments from Dr. Chavra sir, and then uh, we'll we'll move to the next case. Yeah, Ranjit, uh, my only point is that we should not lose the opportunity to be able to get a good sagittal balance at the first go. Uh, in this uh, uh, spine, in the acute phase, it is much easier to uh, put in a cage in front from behind yes. than in a fused spine where the chances of uh, complications also become more. And uh, um, uh, I find this procedure very easy, where you remove the pedicle from one side and put in a cage from one side. You don't need to go from both the sides in this patient. And uh, 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 so I would not want to lose the opportunity. But I agree that there are various uh, ways of uh, trying to achieve the same outcome. So... so uh very well done, Dr. Junaid. Do you have any take-home message on this? Or, yes, uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Finally. So, in take-home message, the single posterior approach is a safe, cost-effective, as well as the reliable surgical procedure for reconstruction of all the columns of the spine. It reduces the operative time, blood loss, and morbidity associated with the combined approach. For this particular case, Though it is neurologically intact, but, but as it is very unstable fracture. So in that case, if, I mean the operative treatment with anterior reconstruction, our main aim is to, to construct a rigid construct so that we can offer her a single surgery that can attain a maximum outcome. Because if we want to do only posterior, either maybe short or long segment, so eventually there may be still chances of failure. So it may not be feasible for her to bear the second surgery. So that is the message for our perspective. But, but that in opinion may be differed, but in our perspective, I think that's a very good approach. Even in spite of a intact neurological, so sometimes uh, a four fracture, as it is a very unstable fracture, it should be stabilized. So that's my message. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank Guru, you. One, one, any one, scope to one, further one question to Dunayet. Yes. To introduce a case in posturally. Yes. Is it very easy to introduce? Is a long case? Oh, in particular in this area? Uh, yeah. Posturally. Yes, I am I am I'm agreed with the but we are doing these sorts of surgery very frequently. Though there are controversy regarding the, I mean, the anterior column support or not, but as we are doing regularly, so we are very much accustomed. So it seems for lumbar, I think, we, though it is as it is needed, there is a valuable route. So it should be done very cautiously. But as we are doing regularly, so I think we are now almost familiar with this. And as already Dr. Chapra has mentioned, Guru, any scope to question? Further question? Guru, I think we are running out of time. Yes. Further question? Guru, any scope to question? Further question? Guru, any scope to 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 question? Guru, any manage them uh, with only anterior approaches also. So the yes. lumbar fractures are totally different as compared to thoracolumbar fractures. Uh, so uh, you just need to have the good sagittal balance, achieve a stable spine and ultimately a fused spine. So that is yes. what is the aim of surgery in these kind of patients. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Junaid. Uh, can you just... Uh, okay. Now okay. I would like to ask uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Syed Shahidul Islam uh, so to present his case, uh, because he's going to present on a, a 
case which is in continuum to uh, what Dr. Junaid presented. Sir, you are muted. Unmute. Dr. Islam, you are muted. So by the time, uh, uh, by the time, uh, sir is logging in. So yeah. today, so we have moved over and we do the same thing, but by our, our Olif access. We do the posterior MI screw and do the corpocotomy by Olif and uh, you know the yes. struggle of pulling the root, pushing the root. I've given up that now. When I do it now, I same sitting lateral screws and uh, oblique approach, Olif approach corpocotomy. So the struggle. Yes. Same thing, but am I achieved MIS way? MIS. Good. Over to you, sir. Uh, Professor Aslam, Islam, over to you. Okay. Can I start now? Sure, sir. Please sit. go ahead. Thank you, dear uh, moderators uh, and the presenters, as well as other faculties, uh, for giving me the opportunity for this case discussion. So, this patient came to our emergency department. Uh, this is a 37 year old. Male patients had road traffic accident and came to the emergency department with back pain. And he has uh, ACSC neurology. And doing this x ray, we found there's a fracture at the lumbar one vertebra. And uh, to see the morphology better, we did the CT scan. Uh, we found this one. And uh, what to do next? Dr. Ranaul Islam, please. Thank you, sir, uh, for asking me the question. Uh, I'd like to do a MRI of the lumbar spine and screening whole spine. Uh, because yes, definitely, MRI, because MRI because has been... Yes, MRI yes, is a little axial section. I'd like to see how much the red topaz fragments or uh, is there any uh, compression over the uh, conus fibularis or not. I'd like to see that by the MRI. So to me, uh, seeing this uh, lateral view of the CT scan, there is a yes, increase. Is there any interspinous interspinous species increase? PLC is not so, intact. So the I suspect a posterior ligament complex injury because clinically it was not evident and uh, uh, X-ray there is no gap between the spinous process. But as there is a gap between the uh, uh, spinous process and CT scan, I did the MRI also, and this is the MRI. Yes. yes. And definitely, you can see here is the PLC injury. Yes. yes. And now, what to do this patient for this patient? Sorry, I have no axial section. I have not put it that. Whatever may be the axial section. Uh, uh, any, 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 anybody other than on our place? So for me, uh, if I can answer for me, it is again posterior surgery. I'll put yes. One segment above, one segment below, index screws. And I would put it MIS. I will not do it open. Thank I you very much. Agree. I do agree with Dr. Ranjit for this particular case. Dr. Very Ranjit, so sir. I have a query regarding this. As the patient is already a C, so no. in that particular case. So... No, no, it is not a CSC. Yes, CSC. 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 CSC, yes. So, do you still consider MIS for this patient? Definitely yes. Definitely yes. For me, more than unless the CT is showing more than 60-70% of canal compromise, I will not touch the canal. Because for okay. me, this is a uh, you know it's a vicarious canal. It's already contused. The dura is stretched. Maybe my bit torn also. I go in and decompress. I'll. It has been proved beyond doubt that it doesn't add to my neurologic recovery. In this, I have to get all the sagittal parameters right. Get the column, get the carotid carophosis, give stability and indirectly decompose the canal, which I'm very much I can sure get with the ligament or taxis because the patient has come in fresh. There is no reverse cortical sign. So I have a query regarding this because as our previous speaker, Professor Dr. Shalom sir, has mentioned that only the split laminar sign is the probably the only indication for decompression. But in our perspective, suppose this patient has already presented with HCSC with bowel yes, bladder yes. involvement. So no, in no. that case, no, in no bowel bladder involvement. HCSC, no. no bowel bladder involvement. Only, only HCSC neurology. Chabra sir, your Chabra sir want to say something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, see, I would uh, uh, definitely.
try to achieve decompression, but I would try to achieve an indirect decompression. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I am uh, uh, almost sure that I should be able to achieve that as soon as I position the patient. Then how you put in the index screws also determines how you achieve decompression. So I would put the index screws in the line of the pedicles, right? So that when I put in the rod, the vertebral body gets corrected, the kyphosis, local mm -hmm. kyphosis gets corrected and decompression is achieved in that patient. So um, even otherwise, an AISC should recover most probably to AISE, but I should be able to get an indirect decompression. But I would differ from Ranjit in that I will use six screws. If the patient is very bulky, I may use eight screws means uh, I will use the index uh, vertebra screws. I will go one level below, one level above. And if the patient is very bulky, two level above. But I will put in a peak cage, right, uh, from one side, you know, because the disc is involved. If you see the MRI, the okay. disc is grossly involved. And if you do not put in a support there, the disc will certainly uh, collapse with time. All right, and the, all the stress will come on the implant, and that may fail. So there is no harm in going in one fr from one side, putting in a peak cage there, which would act like an anterior support. So six screws, peak cage, indirect decompression, follow up the patient in the MRI, most probably post-op uh, screening MRI. I would have achieved good decompression. If the patient does not improve subsequently, right, does not continue to improve, you can always uh, do a, a direct decompression later. How this differs from where uh, the previous case is, this is at the cord level. Yes. The chances of uh, deterioration with uh, aggressive direct decompression are more, especially when the cord is injured. And... Uh, um, uh, so, uh, I would uh, try to be a bit conservative in this case. So, two questions, sir. How do you yeah. put in the, you go a trans for a trans facetal access to put in the cage? Yeah, uh, either trans facetal, actually, you can go extra facetal also, remove the disc and put in a cage without affecting the facet. So, the cage will span from the upper end plate of the, uh, the lower end plate of the upper vertebra into the body? Or into the no, body. not in the body, not only body. in the disc in space. Between, in between the disc space, only in the disc space. Interesting. My, my question is part of the end plate is preserved, not the full end plate is affected. Right? Another question so, do you always get a post operative MRI in all your traumatic spines? I always uh, generally try to get, unless the patient can't afford it. Screening MRI costs only 3500 rupees. It's not about money, sir. Money is uh, irrespective of money, yeah. So, Okay. I, I, I want to document, document okay. post-operative yeah. what is the amount of decompression I have achieved. Dr. Ajay, do you do you get it done, sir, in the center? Because in Ranjay, the high Ranjay. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 What we do in our uh, perspective that uh, I always uh, try to use the I mean the fracture vertebra. And this is a junction at L1 level. I would like to provide the stronger you know, stand. Two, two level above and two level above. And two level below. Yes, definitely. Because I also support you. Is, uh, uh, it will provide the stronger support. On L1, the junction of so short segment, I to me and our observation many times it fails. So in that case, definitely we are all the time practicing uh, the fracture vertebra in mean, the index vertebra. Both sides I stabilize and also two above and two below. And that provides the excellent result. Interesting. Yes, sir. Basically, it shows uh, that Dr. there are many options. Okay, Shalom, will, you, will, you, will you do it by miss or open? You can do MIS, you know, MIS uh, and also uh, ligament toxicity submission if it is a fresh case. Okay. Dr. Ajay, do you get a poster of MRI done all, all your traumatic spines like Professor Chabda? No, excellent. Ajay, 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 what do you want to do for this patient? My approach is probably like Ranjit explained, but I would, uh, I mean, I'm not a MIS guy. I do MIS fixations, but for me, the principle is the same. You do one screw above, one, one above, one below. 
मोशन and uh, uh, there are many literature support in favor of short segment fixation in this fracture vertebra you see there this is the x ray post operative x ray i don't have any post operative mri or ct scan and see the movement of the patients i want to show uh, very interested to show the movement of the patient that's why i put this video in front of you this is the 37 year old uh, worker is a deliver and you see uh, this is the vertebra uh, and chabra uh, uh, was saying about the disc injury in this area you see the disc space yes. this is 18 month follow up the patient is quite well and is the after 2 years he is not returning back to me he okay. says okay. thank you uh, so that's your last slide sir no no i, I Uh, do I have to support this is the paper given by uh, Ajay yeah. Prashad Shetty was there, Raja Shekhar and Rishi Kanna, and they said that reduction of unstable thoracolumbar spine injury even with uh, low shear in class C grade seven can be achieved and maintained with the use of short segment radicular screw fixation, including the fracture vertebra, avoiding the need for anterior reconstruction. Okay. I, so, okay. thank you, sir. Thank so, you. That, so that so that yes, I will invite uh, Dr. Guru Raj. to start his uh, presentation on levels of fixation in thoracolumbar fractures i think we have set the ground with the two cases and the discussions wherein we want to go short segment long segment dr shahla want to go long segment i want to go short segment sure. so over to you dr gururaj to give so, your presentation dr shahidul can you unscare on screen your screen uh... can you unshare your screen stop sharing rather yeah 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 stop sharing Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, let, let me share my screen. Screen. Okay. okay. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So. Ah, uh, so ah, uh, uh, as ah uh, very well ah uh, said by Dr. Ranjit. Ah, uh, we we were already discussing about ah uh, whether we do short segment, long segment, or. Uh, intermediate risk cruise uh, let's see in which situation we do what basically there are multiple options so always whenever we see such kind of fractures we are at the crossroads uh, what to do whether we do long segment whether we do short segment uh, so wh what are the indications so we already discussed this whenever there is a involvement of all three columns which causes instability which can cause progressive neurological deficits which can cause a significant kyphosis more than 30 degrees and if there is a canal compromise in the presence of neurological deficits so aims of the surgery as we were already discussing to achieve a good alignment uh, according to the area of the spine and good stability a kyphosis correction and a direct or indirect decompression and functional outcomes or a pain reduction so once we decided for surgery so what we all usually face is the what dilemma is whether we do a short or long segment fixation whether we should should do a mono segmental versus a short segment fixation whether we should do a short segment with or without intermediate screw fixation or whether to do a posterior fixation alone or a anterior column reconstruction so these are the examples that's a mono segmental fixation that's a short segmented fixation with intermediate screws long segment fixation 
again a short segment fixation with anterior reconstruction a long segment fixation with anterior reconstruction so let's see where we do and what we do so these are the two classifications which actually guide us ultimately what we want to do so let's see how these classifications help us uh, in our future slides so that's a typical monosegmental fixation and whenever you do a monosegmental fixation it is kind of mandatory to do a interbody fusion also so because so that it becomes more stable fixation so when can we do such a, uh, a monosegmental fixation where we are fixing only one disc level so that is if there is a only one end plate involvement is present both pedicles are intact of the index vertebra and kyphosis is less than 15 degrees yes we can say we seldomly need surgery in such kind of patients but these patients when they present with neurological deficits so you might have to do surgery then you can do monosegmental fixation in such patients so it is a uh, 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 literature which supports that monosegmental fixation is an effective method uh, when it is done in a properly indicated patients again uh, another paper which supports monosegmental fixation uh, if it is uh, done in a properly indicated patients uh, so what is the advantages advantages is definitely it takes a less operative time less blood loss less segments fused especially when it comes to lumbar spine less chances of adjacent segment degeneration and specially useful as i said in lumbar and thoracolumbar junctional spines and it disadvantage is it's a less stiff construct if you don't choose your patients properly there is a more chance of implant failure if there was a kyphosis initially and then you have corrected that there is a can have a loss of kyphosis reduction and there can be need of supplementary bracing or activity reconstruction a restriction so now when we span two level discs so that's called as a short segment fixation there can be uh, we we do one vertebra above and one vertebra below so or this is a monosegmental fixation so what is the difference so you do short segment fixation when both end plates are involved that's a, a type uh, a4 of a burst fracture and significant kyphosis is there more than 15 degrees and pedicles are involved and fractures are involving posterior ligamentous complex at different levels so that's an example again of two types of short segment fixation one is we have used the intermediary screws one where we have not used intermediary screws so let's see what is the advantage of these intermediary screws as we were already discussing with the advent of intermediary screws the long segment fixation is almost has become a rarity when it comes to thoracolumbar especially burst fractures until unless it's a type c Uh, it has become a rarity where we do a a long segment fixation so actually it gives the better stability and it also helps you in reducing the kyphosis in a better way and restores spinal canals uh, by pushing the retropulse fragment when you put this index screw into the pedicle so these are few uh, articles which support the intermediary screw fixation and which is more superior over just doing a short segment fixation one vertebra above and one vertebra below so then next thing is a long segment fixation long segment fixation when you involve more than two disc levels so if you involve three disc levels or if you involve four disc levels that is two vertebra above and two vertebra below so it is indicated in translational injuries that is type c injuries or if you have a load sharing classification score of uh, mccormick gains classification score of 7 or more and if you don't want to do a anterior reconstruction in these patients like junaid did where the lsc score was more than 7 and he did a anterior reconstruction with a short segment fixation but then if you want to avoid doing anterior reconstruction you have you can do a long segment fixation and in a non compliant uh, a, a psychotic patient or where you uh, see that patient is not able to adhere to your post of uh, bracing so you can again do a long segment fixation it's a very stiff and stronger construct it has got a high failure strength and there is no significant loss of motion in upper and middle thoracic spine you can do it there in lumbar spine actually you have to choose your patients very well 
and there is no need for bracing and restricted activity when you do long segment fixation obviously when we do a long segment fixation there is more operating time more blood loss more morbidity so more loss of motion in thoracolumbar junction when we do it at there because we are in going to involve lumbar segments and increase chances of asd because it's a more stiffer construct there are few articles which actually compared uh, short segment versus long segment fixation and you can see that they inferred that there is no difference between ultimately doing a short segment to a long segment fixation so then again one more uh, paper which suggests uh, basically a short segment fixation is almost equal to doing a longer segment fixation but only they say that if you do a longer segment fixation the kyphosis correction and maintenance of that kyphosis correction is better than compared to a short segment fixation so these are a uh, biomechanical studies which ultimately say that a longer segment fixation is required if you are not doing a anterior reconstruction so this is a like a mathematics now so when we do and what we do in when it comes to translational injuries when you want to do a long segment fixation uh, when you have a gls score of less than 7 you can do just a posterior alone fixation and get out if it is 7 or more you can do posterior plus anterior column reconstruct if it is no translation if it is if it is a type b injury then you can do a short segment fixation with less than 7 score only posterior if 7 or more posterior plus anterior or you can do a long segment fixation so in summary mono segmental fixation is can be done only if one plate is involved short segment fixation if both end plates are involved with kyphosis intermediary screw fixation is preferred in wherever it is possible and it is the game changer and long segment fixation with or without anterior reconstruction in type c injuries thank you thank you dr gururaj that was excellent very precise and to the point and uh, now let me invite uh, professor uh, anwarul islam to speak about thoracolumbar fractures in a polytrauma situation when and what or to professor anwar because side area you Meanwhile, we can keep the questions ready for uh, Dr. Guru Raj and uh, Professor Anwar. Okay. Unmute, Karo. So you are unmuted, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dr. Ranjit, for giving me the opportunity to be uh, tell something in front of all of you. My topic is on thoracolumbar uh, fracture in polytrauma. When and what? Look at this scenario. Uh, Mrs. Nisha, twenty-one years old, presented to the casualty department of our hospital with the history of fall from height on her back, and she was respiratory distress and pain in the back and upper part of the left thigh as well. Let's get directly to the critical examination part for discussion. Uh, chest uh, uh, regarding chest examination: decreased chest movement and diminished breath sound on both lung fields. Hyper resonant percussion note on both lung fields. Uh, left lower limb was found apparently shortened and more externally rotated. Ecchymosis was present over the lateral aspect of the left upper thigh. The tenderness present over lateral aspect of the left upper thigh as well. The uh, sensory diminish uh, along the distribution of the L three, four, five, and S one dermatomal region bilaterally, and distal vascular status uh, intact in the both lower limbs. Muscle power of the both lower limbs was two by five. That is knee flexor, extensor, ankle plantar, and dorsiflexors, and inverter or inverter of in all. Uh, it was ACS C injury. This is the X-ray you just see. The patient presented with the intertrochanteric fracture as well as this is the intertrochanteric fracture, and this is the chest X-ray where you can see the involvement of the both lung fields, and this is the X-ray of the lumbosacral spine, where you can see the uh, lumbar fracture at the L2 level. You just see, though it is a not good X-ray. This is the MRI. MRI which can you show the L2 fracture and how much the neurological uh, compression over there. And 
you just see the how much the red topaz fragments over there and it is uh, it was more on the left side this is the ct of this patient you just see how much the uh, red topaz fragment and fracture was there how would you manage this case which one should be treated first and when would you treat the thoracolumbar fracture and how this is the question it is defined as a clinical state with the following uh, criteria of the multisystemic involvement that is a uh, definition of the polytrauma you know all and polytrauma patients may present with associated thoracolumbar fracture with, with or without neurological compromisation but this patient has acsc injury well the concept and timing of fracture fixation for isolated spinal injury with or without neurological compromisation are well defined in the pertinent literature the question about the ideal time point and modality of spinal fracture fixation in severely injured patient remains an ongoing topic of debates this is damage control orthopedics uh, you know damage control concept for the unstable spine injuries have not been widely implemented yet uh, there is uh, on literature where spine damage control is a safe and effective treatment modalities for the unstable thoracolumbar fracture in a polytrauma patient. It was a hypothesis. Unfortunately, both concept conservative caution and aggressive primary fixation bear inherent risk and danger for severely injured patient. So, in a damage control surgery, there are some potential benefits. That is definitive surgery in a more stable patient, con convenience for surgeons and operative schedule, potential complication or increased antigenic load, that is increased stress and pain, prolonged bed test, which may lead to the pressure sore, DVT, and pulmonary complications. Difficulty in adequate positioning or mobilization. You just see early total care. The patient needs early total care for such type of patients. Potential benefits are early stability of the spinal column, reduced antigenic load and unrestricted mobilization and positioning option. No secondary neurological deterioration. Potential complications are hyperinflammation, increased quality blood loss and inadequate resuscitation, aggravation of the lethal triads of death, uh, which may lead to SRIS, sepsis or MSOA. So what do we do? What we should to do? As we all know, the management of polytrauma patients should proceed according to the ATLS guideline, which consists of the primary surgeon simultaneous resuscitation, a rapid assessment and treatment of life threatening injuries, and the then secondary survey and detailed head to toe evaluation to identify all the other injuries. And definitive care, specialist treatment of uh, identified injury. In a polytrauma patient, the consequences of steps for treating different types of injuries in vital is vital. And the window of time during which surgery can be performed for bone injuries is open short. At first, we have to ensure that the patient's ABCs are stable. We should then undertake a detailed secondary survey to identify any other injuries which may have been missed in primary survey. Reasonable precautions should be taken to prevent any other injuries or deterioration of the patient during this period. For example, examination must be done in neutral position, mobilization by log roll method, transport and neutral position in spinal board, and use of cervical collar alloys. Suspected TL injury during primary serve of the patients excludes spinal shock and treatment treat immediately. Imaging for suspected thoracolumbar injuries should be rational and timely. Finally, in tertiary survey categorize the patient according to the various available classification system for developing a proper, proper management plan. You know, uh, thoracolumbar injury classification and its severity score on the basis of the fracture mechanism, neurological involvement, and posterior ligamentous complex in integrity. You know all. I will not go details. This is AO classification of thoracolumbar injuries. You know all. McAfee classification, Dennis classification, other classification as well. Uh, Treatment timing and modality of the thoracolumbar injuries in polytrauma patient may also be affected by the presence of associated limb or pelvic fracture. This is the this is on literature early versus delayed stabilization of femoral fracture. There is a wide consensus on the 
uh, notion that fever shaft fracture should be stabilized as early as possible in polytrauma patients in order to avoid potentially lethal complication. Where a patient with thoracolumbar fracture can be treated conservatively or needs surgical intervention depends on several factors like fracture mechanism and type, neurological involvement, PLC in integrity, amount of loss of vertebral body height, and degree of kyphosis, etc. Operative, you know, different methods of operation, post decompression and stabilization, anterior decompression, stabilization, percutaneous fixation and decompression, that is MIS, long segment, short, short segment, various debate. Let's get back to the case we discussed earlier. The patient was at first managed in the casualty department of our hospital uh, by the uh, hemodynamics table. It was uh, made by the uh, anesthesiologist, respiratory medicine specialist, and the medicine specialist as well. And by the orthopedic surgeon, at first we put the upper tibial skeletal, tra uh, skeletal traction for the trochanteric fracture. And after achieving many stability, she was shifted to the operative department where the underwent ORA by DISS on the left side, done by trauma team. After a week, she was treated by posterior decompression with posterior short segment stabilization by pedicle screw and rod, including apex vertebra from L1 to L3 for burst fracture of L2 vertebra, done by our spine team. That was the fracture. And that was the uh, 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 surgical procedure from the posterior sides. We put in the short segments uh, fixation. We uh, put in index screw. And you just see the postoperative x-ray of the fracture management of the TL fracture as well as the trochanteric fracture. The effect of polytrauma in person with traumatic spine injury, that was by Jackie S. Herbert. And in case of polytrauma, complex bone surgery in a prone patient may prove to be quite delicate in the immediate hours or delays or days following the trauma, which often leads to a poor prognosis in the short and long term. This is another paper that is old traumatic lesion of the dorsal and lumbar spine. On the other hand, if the fracture are treated three to four weeks after the trauma, this makes it difficult to be obtained satisfactory reduction of the sagittal plant deformities and increases the risk of the union in kyphosis. That is percutaneous kyphoplasty or medical screw fixation for the management of the thoracolumbar bus structures. The presence of association, associated lesions could make it difficult to perform conventional spinal surgery early on. Recent development of percutaneous techniques that reduces perioperative morbidity seems to be an alternative approach with suited to damage control orthopedics and could improve the initial care of this vulnerable case. This is another paper, the combination of quick fixation of spine injuries and the minimally invasive technique seems to be particularly relevant in severe polytrauma patients who have a very short surgical window. Treatment sequence uh, for uh, this patient should be standardized and determining according to the degree of urgency of the initial lesion. The evocation of the individual fracture pattern and neurologic compromise as well as reasonably management and timing considering the associated injuries is mandatory for a uh, satisfa satisfying outcome. Thank you, everybody, for patient sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anwar. Uh, may I call upon Dr. Ranjit uh, for his talk now? Yeah, Dr. Gunaraj, can you allow me to share the screen? Uh, you can share. Yeah. Okay. You're seeing my screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, ASSI and BSS. Glad to be with my friend from Bangladesh Spine Society. So, with the with the with the current uh, discussions, let us set the ball rolling. What is the role of uh, minimally invasive surgery in thoracolumbar fractures? So, uh, with we know uh, we when we we have been discussed today many times. You know, what are the factors which we decide in when you treat these fractures? We know we look at the AO or the TLS classification. We look at the neurologic injury. We look at the fracture pattern. We also look at the patient factors, like is it an ang spawn spine or a dish spine, like a stiff spine. And we also look at, as Professor Anwar just mentioned, is it a polytrauma situation or is it a, a, a isolated a spinal injuries? We also we also dealt that we look at the PLC and decide if it's stable or unstable, and we want to operate them for the progressive deformity or for the pain. Now we we have Dr. Gururaj very clearly enlisted these 
uh, goals when you treat these fractures, it is realignment, it is decompression, could be direct or indirect. It could be stabilization with the way of instrumentation. And do we need fusions? You know, rarely we need fusions. So can we achieve all this, uh, you know, via any method? So the first three things is which can easily be achieved by using a MIS technique. And do we see that, do we need fusion in these fractures? So the questions which comes to one's mind is that, if I decompress, how do I decompress? If I have to fuse, how do I fuse? And if I have to reconstruct the anterior column, how do I do it in MIS way? And if I do MIS, do I end up doing longer fusions with MIS? With this, you know, a lot again, well upon this has been discussed today, time and again, this is the un unstable fracture morphology, wherein we go in for surgery. And we also look at these neurologic status based on which we decide about surgery and polytrauma and obesity. So this, in my part of the world, obesity has got a very important uh, decision-making factor when it comes to management of these patients because managing a obese patient non-surgically is quite a headache for us with the risk of DVT and uh, pulmonary embolisms. So again, we look at this picture. Now decompression, we get, we heard this, this discussion some time back when Dr. Shahla mentioned the surgical clearance of the canal does not affect the neurological outcome. Published way back in 2000, 2000 by Professor Dixon. Then what are the indications of canal, canal, canal decompression? When there's, you know, what are the indications when you can do an indirect canal decompression, moderate canal compromise, when the patient comes in fresh within first 40 to 70 hours, when in that PLL, and we don't do it when we see a reverse cortical sign on the CT, also when there's more than 70% canal compromise. These are situations where we should not go for a indirect canal decompression. We have to go for a direct canal decompression. Now, we this is one of our patients where we went ahead and this was the burst fracture with the Asia C neurology, Asia C. We went ahead and uh, she had incomplete deficit, more than 50% canal compromise. So there was no, no uh, reverse cortical sign. We went ahead and did a those days, this is almost uh, 18, 16 years ago, went ahead, did a two above, two below, did not touch the canal, and look at how beautifully the canal has remodeled over 18 months. This is our own patient. So we know that we don't have to always decompose the canal. What about the anterior column? This has been proved beyond doubt in 2020 that the short segment pedicle instrumentation can be sufficient and safe enough in treating thoracomba burst fractures and load sharing classification is losing his strength as a pre predictive value regarding sagittal uh, of regarding anterior collapse. So the so-called LSE is really questionable. And again, there's another paper which even Dr. Gurraj uh, quoted some time back that more than LSC seven, we can go in for a short segment fixation. Don't have to do a long segment or don't have to do an anterior canal uh, reconstruction. Now, how is all this possible? Because of this beautiful thing called index group which will prove beyond doubt that it increases stability by 31%. There is less post-op kyphosis, less incidence of implant failures, and it helps, helps to reduce the level of fixation from four to three. Again, the index crew, time multiple paper saying that it helps in ma better maintenance of kyphosis and the kyphotic angle, thus avoiding a anterior surgery or even anterior column reconstruction. Now the question about fusion. This is one thing which is very questionable when you come to uh, type B, A3, A4, or a B1, B2. In type C, we know it's a fractured dislocation which needs a fusion. So no question of MIS in those, even though I know it's been published by uh, Ganga group that you can do in them also very safely. Now, fusion in B2, B3, stiff spines needs fusion. So we are not discussing it. The vast majority of burst fractures, it's been pure, proved beyond doubt that Fusion will not improve the deformity and functional outcome, but it adds to bleeding, donor side mobility, and time of surgery. So this paper in 2017, is fusion necessary for thoracal burst fractures? It was a meta-analysis which came out with the outcome that use of fusion did not improve clinical outcomes, but it was increased with it was associated with increased surgical time and higher intraoperative bleeding. So there was good enough reason not to fuse any of our burst fractures, which amounts the fact that we can treat them minimally invasively from posterior approach. Now the question, if 
I have to do an anterior approach, an anterior column reconstruction in these patients. Can I do it MIS? Yes, this is one of our, I'll not go through the want of time. These are one of our cases where we did, uh, you know, uh, beautifully, we can reconstruct the anterior column by the index screw. I typically always use, whenever possible, two index screws on both the pedicles, irrespective of the pedicle fracture, and we can beautifully restore the uh, chi focal kyphosis by MIS techniques. Now, in case I need a compact any, can I do it MIS? Yes, very much. One of our patients where we went ahead and first did a, a posterior column reconstruction, followed by, this was an 83-year-old lady, you know, where we went ahead and did first posterior, then we went ahead and did a want of time, I'll skip those slides, we did a minimally invasive, uh, you know, anterior thoracic compactomy and used a cage. So it's very much possible to do anterior and posterior via uh, MIS approach. Now, a note on osteoporotic component fractures, even though which is not the direct uh, topic of the seminar, in these cases, we should distinctly differentiate between a uh, intervertebral instability versus a uh, intravertebral instability. We know the whole lot of procedures wherein we have no vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty, balloon kyphoplasty. Now we have the vertebral body strength. Wherein you do what? In a case of intravertebral instability, these are classical patients wherein you do a standalone vertebroplasty. This is going to fail. So look at these patients. We typically get these shoot through lateral supine x-rays where you can see in this patient with a D12 burst that it just opens up like a balloon, you know, once you do a proper supine shoot through lateral. So this was this to start with was this injury, which eventually over time went ahead and developed these. So these patients, when you see this cleft sign on day one or day two or day or three weeks, these are the ones which are going to progress, are going to develop a kyphosis, have to go and develop pain. These are patients, you should not sit and conserving them. Irrespective of your medical management with uh, teriparatide and uh, calcium, whatever, we go ahead and we did these. This was done way back in 20, 2010, 2011, wherein we did not have the Indian systems. We used this uh, Sexton by, uh, uh, by the Medtronic company and we did cement and screws. So to uh, Dr. Shalom's uh, uh, question about doing long segment insert, this I've got a 14 year follow up on this patient today that she's still holding same. We did a short column fixation with a transpedicular cement and she's holding on. So again to ask, is minimal invasive first specialty treatment of thoracolumbar trauma and lumbar trauma safe? So this paper came with the outcome that minimally invasive surgery in the spine holds significant promise but the current a body of evidence is mediocre at the best and leaves many questions yet, un yet unanswered. If you look at it, this was published in 2014. We are 10 years down the lane. And what does literature tell us today that the use of minimum invasive surgery in, 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 in trauma, this, this, out, this paper was published in 2021, which went and said that MIS techniques have the potential to reduce open approach associated mobility and improve post-operative care and rehabilitation. MIS techniques for spine trauma are an indispensable option. Mind the word indispensable option in the treatment of your spine surgeons. We heard Dr. Uh, Professor Anwar right now quote literature which said that it's very important to have MIS techniques, especially in polytrauma situations. Again, comparison of percutaneous MIS techniques versus open, uh, open spines, uh, open fixation in thoracolumbar fractures. It was a retrospective cohort analysis by Stephen Ludwig from, from Baltimore, which looked at 100 patients of MIS and 155 patients of open, which was a control, control uh, a retrospective analysis study, which said that MIS is for treatment of thoracolumbar fractures are very beneficial. It has got decreased operative time, decreased blood loss, and fewer transfusions. Very important in a polytrauma situations. So what are the pros of MIS techniques? Number one, decreased blood loss. It hardly needs any post-op transfusions. It's hardly, it's quick. You don't have, you don't spend the time opening up, closing, suturing, putting all that. There is decreased operative time, less post-operative pain, less incidence of surgical site infections and in isolated fractures, minimal hospital stay and less chance of 
proximal junctional failures or proximal lumbar failures and because we preserve the midline. So to take home, I can do saying that or thoracomal fractures are not indications for MI surgery. Don't do it in a type C fracture or in one which requires a posterior fusion. Remember, the surgical goals of open as well as MIS are the same. Just because you're doing an MI surgery, you should not do a minimal surgery or end up doing a minimal decompression. You have to restore. The goals are the same. You have to aim and strive to achieve it the same way you would open. In case of osteoporotic fractures, assess for intra or intervertebral instability and use these procedures, vertebroplasty, carpoplasty, with care. And when in doubt, you can go in for hybrid techniques. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ranjit. Uh, the uh, session is open for discussion uh, for the talks of Dr. Uh, Dr. Anwarul, Dr. Ranjit and uh, myself. Yes, if anybody sir. has any questions. Yes, Chabra, sir. Yeah, uh, uh, Guru Raj, you had mentioned that um, in the thoracic and thoracolumbar spine motion segments, the number of motion segments you fix uh, do not uh, make any difference in the outcome. Uh, I... No, no, sir. I said uh, motion segment, they make the difference. So that is why I said we need to fix lesser segments when it comes to thoracolumbar and lumbar uh, spine. No, no, but thoracic? So thoracic, I know uh, basically, uh, I would say the thoracic is the lesser evil as compared to the lumbar and the thoracolumbar junction. and But then the thoracic spine also is very important because in a wheelchair-bound patient, the rotatory movement is uh, very yeah, important. That's that's what I wanted to point out. You made yeah. a difference. You said thoracic, it doesn't matter as much as thoracolumbar and lumbar. I would only want to contest that. I think all levels, it's important to say motion segments, especially in those with neurological deficit, because uh, their independence on the wheelchair depends on the rotational movement, which is there at the facet joints, which gets compromised with the level of fixation that you do. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? If no questions, then I would like to move to the next case. Uh, that is from uh, Dr. Ashan, Dr. Kamrul Ashan. Thank you, Guru. Yes, sir. Is it visible? Uh, yes. yes, sir, it's visible. Yes, sir, you can go ahead, sir. Let's see. Okay, thank you, Guru. Sir, continue. Kamul, sir, continue. Yes. This case presentation, 45 years old male, day labor, had a history of fall from top of the running bus and sustained trauma on his back, chest, and abdomen. And he is diagnosed as a case of polytrauma victim. Initially, he was managed according to ATLS protocol at district hospital by cells drain, nasogastric tube, and two units of blood transmission. Two days later, he was transferred to private hospital, ICU, and managed accordingly. Two weeks later, he came to our emergency unit, and on examination, we found patient, is con patient was conscious, GCS score 15, patient is anemic, blood pressure 90 by 50, pulse 90 bit per minute, Respiratory rate 22 per minute, and there is a gross deformity present on his back. The patient is unable to move his both loyal limbs and catheter in situ. And hematological investigations found hemoglobin 9 gram per liter, neutrophilic leukocytosis, creatinine 1.7, urea 56, ESR 45, C reactive protein 12 milligram per liter, serum amylase, serum blood sugar, serum electrolytes within normal range. Access shows there is a haziness of the right lawyer, June, and ECU was normal. 
And neurologically, we found sensory absent below D12 and motor power both values zero, bulbocommonal reflex present, but no sectal sparing, no voluntary anal contraction, absence of any sensory at C4 and C5 level, and absence of deep anal sensation. So according to a shear impairment scale, it was a case of type A, that is complete spinal injury. And this is an X-ray, line X-ray and lateral view, I missed the AP view. Here shows an complete translation at the level of D11 and D2, over the D12. And cervical spine X-ray and others normal. I want to put a question. Will you go for CT scan or MRI? Which one you would prefer, faculty? Okay, uh, Dr. Ajay? Sir, you're muted. Okay. Anybody? Um, so I, I would, yes, I would do a CT scan uh, rather than MRI because yes. uh, I already know that what is happening to the cord there. Uh, so I would do a CT scan to see the basically pedicles and um, how much of uh, uh, body is anterior to the lower bo lower body. So, but then typically we but, would both. But then if given a choice, one, then I would do a CT scan. If it's a polytraumatized patient, I think it's better to get a whole body CT so that if it's available. Yeah. Quick screening. But patient is come to be a poor family. Unfortunately, we don't do any CT scan. We did only MRI. Sir, uh, sir, yeah. sir, can I ask an old question? Yes. Sir, uh, is there any yes. X-ray of the other limbs and long bones as well? Yes, um, there is a one X-ray on the right forearm. There is a found fractures in the um, styroid process on the right side. And other limbs injuries, okay. And cervical spine, there is no cervical spine injury. Only there is a this type of injury. So we did not do any CT scan, only MRI. Sir, in a, in a, in here, a thor thor thoracic okay. injury, whether it was the spontaneous pneumothorax or other form of thoracic yes, injury. Yes, the patient initially treated in ICU, the hematorax and potens has drained and treated in ICU for at least two weeks. After two weeks, patient come to us. So that's after, that's a very that's a very two important. After two weeks, the point. patient was hemodynamically stable, sir. Yes, I also already mentioned the hematological investigations. Yes. So that's okay, very fine. important point. Whenever it comes to type C injuries uh, at thoracolumbar junction and thoracic spine, you should always always go ahead and um, do a chest CT uh, to see a uh, uh, hemonumothorax and uh, yes. injuries. Yes, patients are um, suffering from hematorax and they are treated in ICU. Mm -hmm. After calm, we found um, brain X-ray. Brain X-ray only there is a haziness, nothing else. And uh, patient GCS score is 15 and patient is almost stable. Okay. okay. And this is an so MRI. Initially, so initially there is a fracture dislocation that is type C injury of the D11-12 with yes. the Spontaneous pneumothorax, no, yes, no head yes. injury or other thing was. No other injury. Patient GC score was okay. only 15. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Okay, so what to do? And this is a case of complete paraplegia due to traumatic spondyloptosis at D11 over D12. I think uh, Dr. Sahil has been uh, very quiet all the while. Dr. Sahil, what, what do you want to do? Uh, such a patient two weeks old. Uh, with the kind of situation so two weeks old i think uh, as this is a type c fracture dislocation uh, there is a complete deficit and the patient is now stable so the sur surgery is the only choice and long segment fixation would be uh, the choice of fixation in this uh, as we do not have ct so we do not know uh, about the pedicles of d11 and d12 and we also don't know about how much the combination is in the lower body, that is a D12. But the major problem in such cases, if it is two weeks old, is the uh, how do we reduce such fractures? 
and yes. there are there are very and there are many reduction maneuvers which have been described but with then they uh, in complete spondylop process <clears throat> i think we'll have to do a wide laminectomy two or three levels and a complete facet resection uh, i'm not sure i've read articles about pre operative halo pelvic traction or halo bifemoral traction but i don't know i have never personally used it or seen it uh, that i would like to ask the faculty over here if Uh, anybody in such uh, two week old fractures whether they put a patient on a pre operative traction or just go in the ot and then put in reduction screws do all the maneuvers with the rods and do a complete facetectomy with laminectomy and try to reduce such fractures uh dr janaid ajay sir has a point yeah uh, i sir I, i will come to you sir we'll come to you uh, uh, janaid yeah yeah Uh, how will you how will you reduce this fracture this this so, location basically this is a case two, of already 12, 12 days old as two weeks said, two weeks old two weeks old yes that is two weeks mm -hmm. so good thing is that as it is a complete spinal injury so no worries about the neurological status mm -hmm. so in that particular case we usually do i mean the after the midline exposure uh, first of all we need to we set the facet and put the longitudinal traction and levering of the i mean the lower vertebra and uh, just put a pressure on the forwards and up backwards and upwards so that the proximal vertebra it is rotated upwards so it can be easily rotated reduce is it clear uh -huh. okay okay uh, so let, let's hear dr ajay sir No, I agree with him. Like two weeks should not be a problem of reduction. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean it's relatively mobile. There are many different techniques. You can put a rod proximally, rod distally, hold it, lever it, remove yeah. the facet, distract it, and try to reduce it. There are many ways to do it, but two weeks is not a problem. If it is two months, then without carpectomy, you won't be able to reduce it. Yes. yes. And uh, uh, can I? Can I? Uh, Dr. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ranji. So in these patients, you know, uh, more than the reduction technique, be careful about the soft tissue injury. What will happen when you try to reduce it? So if you, yeah, yeah. I have faced three months, uh, six weeks, eight weeks. So especially the thoracic spine, the moment you go in and try to do all this maneuvering, you will tear in the costal and they will bleed. So be prepared about that. The soft tissue, especially the vasculature, there will be a lot of hematoma there, which works like a tampon art. the moment you try go in open up expect a bleed expect a massive bleed be prepared for it or just don't think that we can go with the cart and it will reduce it so that is the thing yeah. to remember getting them reduction is not a not at all an issue you will get it at any point of time but the soft issue the bleeding is what we should always keep in mind ajay yes. sir ajay sir yeah can okay. i can, can i ask you one thing Yes, uh, in a uh, two weeks fracture dislocation, that is uh, such type of type C injury. Not always been reduced easily. Sometimes it is difficult to be reduced. In hot, that situation, corpectomy can be an option if not reduce uh, uh, usual yes. procedure. Yes, corpectomy is an option, but yes, most of the time it may yes. not be necessary. Okay. Um, as as I would our, like to add, like as Ranjit said, uh, Ajay, in our perspective, two weeks, three weeks, even we have to do surgery. And uh, it is to the upper mobilizing. Even the manual traction, sometimes we do it. There are a lot of ways to reduce, but also we give the traction holding the head portion, also the lower portion. And since it is a complete uh, and the transected, no, 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 nothing to no lose. So it is it is possible. Two weeks is okay, but it is it is two. There is a four weeks or six weeks or two months even. Then it is very difficult and sometimes yes. And facetic to me not that much. It is already facet is dislocated. Disrupted. Facet already disrupted. Facet yeah. facet yes. already yeah. disrupted. Okay. Ajay uh, sir, so, what Ajay sir, what point you want to add? You are. I want to. I agree with you. This is not a case which should send our junior most resident to do, because <laughs> suddenly there will be a blood loss when they try to manipulate. Yes. It will yes. be 500 ml, one liter of blood loss. Yes, and sir. That's what is important. It is important. And CSL. not only, not only uh, yes, the, uh, during manipulation, you know, even sometimes uh, it goes the most uh, and the inform can damage also the great vessel. Great vessels. Anterior. Yes, that is it. The great vessel damage. 
Yeah. yeah. So, so, so it's routine for us, you know, after we have these old injuries, we immediately get a chest x-ray done and slightest doubt put a chest tube inside. Put a chest tube inside and then you take the patient out of the theater. Just get a chest x-ray done because, uh, because the bleeding might not be happening into the wound. It might happen into the thoracic cavity. And then right. they, you don't know, have to extubate them. So we always get a chest x-ray done and put a chest tube. <clears throat> so I just don't put a chest tube. This is the right so, Dr. Ranjit, is, it your, is it your routine practice? These old presentations, Prachar dislocate, because like Professor Shah also mentioned, I've had great vessel injuries. After, after two months, you know, T6, T7, T4, T4, T5, root of arch of iota. You know, yeah. old ones did all the heroics, reduced it, post-op patients, hypotension, hypotension. The thing was at the vessel, I lost the patient. I lost the patient because, it, uh, you know, in old injuries, you try to, earlier days in career, you did not understand that the soft tissue is contracted there, it is fibrous there, you are trying to go do all the heroics, you are just focusing on the vertebral column. And then you end up disrupting the vessels. So be very careful with these. Like what Sir mentioned, only the most experienced should go in for this case. You, because you think it is type C, the, there is nothing called spinal cord there. Don't just go in and you know try to do uh, this thing. You will you will, you will Ranjit, use the... Yes, sir. Ranjit, <clears throat> not, not yes. only not only for the thoracic spine, can be in a lumbar and cervical spine as well. True that, true that, true that. Yes. More common, I... more common in the thoracic spine and thoracic lumbar junction. Chabra, yes. sir. Chabra, yeah. sir. I am very much, very much agree to with uh, other Shetty as she, he mentioned that since there was sometimes we think that okay total transaction just uh, uh, instant yeah. juniors go and do it straight away it is it is not that because they don't there is no chance to regain the neurology but sometimes this sort of catastrophe can occur during the mobilization it's true this should be done the those who are experienced okay yes, sir, I was the one of those juniors someday in life sir I faced it that's yeah. how you do that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Ranjit. Uh, sir, uh, Chabra, sir, uh, do we need to reduce these fractures always or can we do in-situ fixations in them? Yes. Uh, we can do in-situ fixations, Gururaj, but uh, just in we case did. we find a cure tomorrow, right? If we can maintain a patent canal, it's always better because we can do that easier right now than at a later stage. Huge give pass. There is a yeah. huge give pass. This is so, the scenario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah scenario. And it needs to reduce. But I would uh, only want to mention that uh, it's not always easy to reduce such fractures because you have there is a very significant amount of force which results in a spondyloptosis in the spine. Imagine the amount of force that would have done this and you have to recreate that force to correct it. So yeah, in such cases, sometimes uh, we have used the Harrington distractor as very useful in trying to reduce it. And um, I would uh, not hesitate in doing a shortening procedure by doing a corpectomy. Because then a reduction becomes very easy for me. And uh, trying to maintain that uh, uh, vertebra is not serving any benefit to me. So I would, uh, rather than doing a lot of uh, struggle and um, trying to also cause vascular compromise, as mentioned before, uh, my threshold to do a corpectomy and reduce it would be low. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kamrul Ashan. Uh, okay. okay. You Thank you. you. I, I do agree with Dr. Sambra, sir. What, what, do you what, what we did, we did posteriorly, everything go for posteriorly. Mm -hmm. And what I find after giving an anesthesia, I start incision from above and below, and then go the flexor side. After releasing all the muscle from the both proximally and distally, there is a, some sort of reduction is automatically occurred. And then I put in screw. Four screw above and four screw below. Then I put a long rod, then distal leaf, and by giving a towel clip distraction, it is automatically reduced. And then I put in another rod. And this okay. is the uh, this is the special scenario. Nice. And this is the follow up X-ray. Okay, nice. But unfortunately, after Three, four weeks, patients develop severe pneumonia consolidation and respiratory distress, and patients again shifted to ICU. And ultimately, patients develop septicemia, 
and he expired after within four within weeks okay and, so and so one thing one thing is that after exposure i found there is a csf huge csf leakage and dura is totally lacerate so okay. what uh, in this situation what will you do and dura is totally lacerate and there is a csf leakage continuously so usually usually uh, what in my experience what i have seen is this traumatic dural uh, ruptures or a uh, complete transactions completely transaction uh, csf yeah the csf leakage uh, stops uh, after some time uh, yes. so you need not do anything for uh, to stop this leakage which is which is even impossible also uh, so I, i have not experienced a persistent leakage coming from these sort of injuries uh, so anybody has any experience they can comment actually i, I have one question to dr sabra sir sir uh, in that case uh, seven days after surgery the patient died with septicemia what was the reason for septicemic uh, development of the septicemia or further uh, pneumonic consolidation you see the patient was a, was a polytrauma patient and yes. had probably infection even before so one has to be more aggressive in management and uh, stabilization of these patients uh, and uh, uh, the surgery would also have been prolonged because um, uh, you needed to reduce the patient um, uh, plus the csf leak also adds to the chances of the infection uh, spreading uh, through the dura as well so uh, uh, it is possible one has to be just uh, more aggressive in such patients in trying to reduce the chances but similar of what i did i totally yeah. give a um, stitch in the proximal dural tear totally yeah. give them stitch so there is a minimization of the dural uh, csf leakage in post operatively and what you, is you, you like it at that side beautifully like it like it like it like it like it, like it, like it yes, yes like it like it yeah and post operatively what is okay, completely heal there is no okay but subsequently but, patient develop okay okay pneumonic okay. consolidation okay uh, dr ashan that's a nice case and i think uh, you executed it very nicely but unfortunately patient succumb to patient. comorbidities so yes. thank you thanks for your case presentation we are already 1017 now so we'll okay. go to the last case uh, that is from um, okay thank you guru give me an opportunity yeah dr yeah. sail batra is a senior consultant uh, uh, spine surgeon at uh, jalandhar and um, he has been the alumni of uh, isic also so <laughs> what you dr sail thank you so much moderators for giving me the opportunity to present uh i'm not able to Hello. share you you are on uh, apple yeah i am on apple ranjit please no you should be just able to share screen i am uh, trying to share the screen it says it says choose what to share with the app.zoom.us and i'm choosing the entire screen okay. but then mm -hmm. then there are two options cancel and share the cancel one is blue but the, i cannot press on the share button so you hold shift and then you select hold shift shift yeah. and then try to share uh, i'm still not able to hold shift hold and once once you once you select shift you yeah. so are you on an external screen external monitor or just your laptop just the laptop yes then so then you should be able to so once you say shift share screen you will see your desktop up there which says basic advanced and files so, so go to basic and and uh, share your desktop one I have uh, just shared on the WhatsApp what I am getting. Doctor Anjit, can you please see? I'll just see. Meanwhile, Doctor Guru, you can take uh, questions. Yeah. Uh. Okay. Okay. So 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 I I I got you. So you are uh you're trying to so you select the entire screen. I've 
touch on the entire screen but i am not able to uh, if you want to then log off and log in log off and log in don't waste time minimum we will take questions log off and log in okay yeah yeah so uh, by the time uh, dr sahil bata is coming in i have a question to the uh, to the to the panelists to the experts so in case of a polytrauma which what uh, uh, dr uh, uh, professor anwar uh, just uh, you know uh, uh, discussed Uh, is what is the pattern you follow, Dr. Ajay Shetty, Dr. Uh, Chavda sir, in your institute when you have a spine, a spine trauma, a spine fracture with a limb fracture, with respect to a long bone fracture, not necessarily not a part trochanteric what he what he discussed right now, a femur, a tibia, or a humerus, what get the preponderance? So we all understand that we have to operate on the unstable spines of a stable patient. so we get the atls protocol and procedure we have the abc or d all men all all stabilized then what do you do first do you do the spine first and then do the limb or you do the limb first then do the spine if you do the spine first do you do the limb at the same sitting and if you don't do the same sitting do you use an external fixator or anything to temporarily uh, span this fracture while you you, fix you give all the answers <laughs> no, so that the how do you make out the how do you made out make out the uh, yeah. the sequence, sir? Sir, Dr. Chabra. So, uh, life threatening uh, uh, right. trauma needs to be managed first. That is the principle of damage control orthopedics. So, if there is, it may not only be a limb fracture; it could be a splenic injury, it could be any other injury, and that needs to be managed at the first go. if it is a limb fracture like a sharp femur fracture right then that takes priority but a tibial fracture doesn't take priority over spinal stabilization but even in the spine uh, you can do just a percutaneous fixation and stabilize the spine and go in for a definitive procedure later when the patient stabilizes so uh, you this uh, you have to uh, take uh, each individual patient on his or her merit and then decide uh, uh, again as i mentioned life threatening uh, injuries take a certain uh, a definite priority it would also def depend on whether it's an incomplete injury or a complete injury and so there are very many factors which were also very appropriately pointed out in the talk okay, number one sir what is your unstable patient stabilize the patient if it is a i mean you have life threatening injuries it needs to be addressed if there is a femur fracture you put an external fixator if there is upper limb injury they do not get any preference till the patient is stabilized and when the patient is general condition is stabilized then you fix the spine do the definitive fixation of the femur once whenever the uh, anesthetist or the intensivist feel yeah. the patient shetty sir can i can i can i tell uh, something regarding this dr anwar dr anwar he is back Anwar, he he has come back. Let's let's go with the case. We are already getting delayed. Okay. Sorry, Over sorry, you, Dr. Batra. Sorry, yeah. Cancel the update. Don't do the update now. Don't do the update. Yeah, no, no, I will not do that. So the issue is because you are updating your macOS. You can make. Okay. Yes. Okay, okay. We can see it. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead. And am I audible? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for patiently waiting uh, for this hiccup. Uh, so I am also going to present the type C uh, fracture. So I do not have uh, the X-rays with me, and this is a patient who came to. If you can see the date, twenty ninth March two thousand twenty. That is the peak COVID time. So the patient didn't have an X-ray, but had the CT and MRI, and came to me forty eight hours uh, down the uh, line. and he came from himachal and he couldn't travel anywhere so uh, somebody contacted me that could you operate and the guidelines in that time for operating were not very clear but then again as he was uh, uh, somebody who came with a strong reference so i had to uh, uh, operate and x rays in our hospital in the hospital where this patient got admitted the x rays uh, on those two days were not Yeah, it doesn't matter you have a ct it gives more yeah. information so it's the ct is there and uh, uh, this is a type c dislocation and uh, there is a fractured body and uh, so 
you've seen complete spondyloptosis in the previous case this is almost like a grade 2 uh, lysis or a dislocation so uh, patient was a 34 year old male fall from height came to me 48 hours after the injury there were no comorbidities there were no other injuries the patient was uh, stable hemodynamically the patient had terrible amount of pain that he could not even turn in his uh, uh, his bed so shifting him was a problem anywhere so now uh, this is the mri so uh, what is uh, the uh, what is what are the, what is the mode of the treatment i think everybody would agree that a surgical treatment is required patient is asia a with a neurological level of t12 with complete random bowel injury complete absence of perianal sensations and voluntary anal contraction and there is no movement in lower limbs no other injuries so what next what are the things to decide one is the timing of surgery as the patient came to us 48 hours late and he was hemodynamically stable so i think timing of surgery was the best uh, whenever we could get the whole team available in such type c injuries would the neurological status in, uh, change anything in the treatment dr guru mm, no it is actually, in... it's, it's ultimately a chance stable type c injury so we need to we need to ultimately uh, operate and stabilize this so yeah, would, would, this, would uh, any of the reduction maneuvers change if it is in asia c versus in asia a so if if it is a uh, incomplete injury then definitely i would uh, drive hard to achieve a complete reduction uh, if it is a asa then i would i would accept whatever uh, reduction why i get i would like yes. to get that kyphosis corrected at that level and get a good alignment and uh, like the in the previous uh, uh, case we discussed there are a lot of reduction maneuvers which dr joy also pointed out there are different reduction maneuvers described by ao by fixing rods either distally and then trying to uh, put lamina spreaders or a facet spreaders or putting a cobs inside or doing facetectomies so whatever way uh, we achieve in reduction but do this uh, uh, pulling the Uh, spinous processes by a uh, towel clips or the lamina spreaders would you use such kind of maneuvers in asia c injuries in incomplete spinal cord injuries or would you like to do a laminectomy and a facetectomy and shorten the spine to reduce it better so as to avoid any further neurological deficit yeah uh, sir dr ajay me see my reduction maneuver remains the same the only thing nowadays what i would do is i would probably use a neuromonitoring but the reduction maneuvers will remain the same but what i usually do in a patient who is neurologically intact is stabilize it put the rod distally use reduction devices or reduction screws gradually try to pull it up at the same time gently distract to disengage basically you need to disengage because when it translate anteriorly there is always an impaction you need to disengage a bit and then the reduction happens gradually shortening is much more damaging procedure especially in a patient who has got an incomplete injury doing a whole vertebra removal is not a simple job <clears throat> so in uh, particularly in that case in a uh, uh, grade 2 lysis is there any need to be shortening of the column no not necessary. No, 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 not, no. Not, not 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 necessary at all usually uh, in, 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 a, in a situation like this the facet locking would have happened yes just so, need to exercise the facet to achieve yes, the reduction yes. so facet to be bilaterally then uh, distraction over the spaces remove the disc and other things and if you uh, use the reduction screw i think it will be easily reduced uh, so how how many would do a interbody fusion here yes i i would like to do interbody fusion uh, uh, if it is asia c but in asia a in c2 fixation and fusion i not, not going for the reduction or uh, reduction even as well okay uh, anybody who uh, who will uh, not do interbody fusion or who will do interbody fusion any comments i have been i have done interbody fusion but uh, nowadays i have given up because it doesn't make yes. any major difference, any difference apart yes. from adding to a lot of blood loss yes procedure uh, because already there is disrupted vessels i mean i had done in uh, patients hoping that it might improve a neurological deficit especially patients who present less than 12 hours 
but never found any difference apart from taking more surgical time. Yeah, I agree same, with you. Same. Stabilization, stabilization is okay. Same here. We, we used to do interbody fusion before, but now it's given up. Okay, Dr. Sail, go ahead. Incomplete, Comrades. incomplete, incomplete uh, in, uh, uh, neurological status, then uh, there may be need to for need for the interbody fusion. In that cases, I think. Unfortunately, in, in a spinal fracture, there is nothing that has proved to be effective apart from we have to reduce a line. No other technique, whether it's post yeah. and clear, you do which you are comfortable with. So okay. technical technique. What matters is <laughs> ABC. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what is the uh, does anybody use an intradiscal maneuvers to uh, reduce such fractures? Because sometimes the facets are completely disrupted, and if sometimes there is too much of spinous process damage, and we cannot pull it by a towel clips. So, do you use some putting a cobs inside the disc and try to maneuver it, or does it cause? All depends more? whether it's ACA or whether it's normal. That ACA ACAC. That depends on the neurology. Yes, yeah, if they, so that, if it's Asia, yeah, you always much more uh, do whatever you want to do. Yes. So, and not causing more blood loss. You don't want to lose a patient because of blood loss. But yeah. apart from that, you are more aggressive. Yeah. So, and uh, Dr. Ranjit, my question to you is that in fresh injuries, have you seen such uh, in in uh, complete dislocations, uh, vascular injuries happening uh, in fresh traumas? You talked about the older uh, times. If the patient comes you, to you after four to six weeks, so then the fresh traumas. Uh, fresh traumas we have seen them happen because we uh, practice in a place where there's a lot of high velocity injuries, but they're always diagnosed because we have a protocol of whole body CT before we, you know, proceed. So of course they are there and they are primarily managed. Okay, sir, so, Chabra, sir. Yeah, I only tend to differ in that in incomplete injuries, I would definitely want to do intradiscal work uh, in order to attempt. Good reduction in order to do a decompression procedure. So, uh, if uh, if this is an old injury, uh, there would be some amount of uh, fibrosis both behind and in front. And by doing a discectomy, uh, the chances of reduction uh, improve. So, I would uh, go in and do a discectomy, try to achieve a reduction. I would. Definitely achieve a reduction in this case if it is an incomplete injury. And um, uh, if I do a discectomy, then I have to do an interbody fusion. Okay, last comment from Ranjit and then Sahil, you can proceed. So, uh, to, so in these cases, a lot of the maneuvers, what you use, depends upon the neurology status. In a incomplete neurology or a partial neurology, you should end up, like Sir mentioned, try to shorten the column, don't try to manipulate much. If it is a complete neurology, it's in like, you know, Asia A, you can do anything. So whatever maneuver you require, and time and again, I think sir has been emphasizing that whatever you do, keep in mind that you have to have an aligned spine and a clear canal. You don't know the future. That's what the message I get. Okay. Uh, yeah. so then go, going ahead, uh, this was the intraoperative picture before uh, when we exposed. So it wasn't much reduced just after the exposure. And this was the intraoperative image uh, when we made the patient prone and after exposure, what we took. And this is what I did. And uh, this was the minimal bony work we did. And decompressed. This is a, now the spine is completely decompressed and aligned and reduced. And if you see, this is the immediate post-op x-ray. I did a long segment fixation and I used an index screw in the fracture site. And it was completely uh, aligned back to the normal. And this was a six month follow up where this anterior fracture uh, seems to be have fused. And uh, here I would want to ask you how many of uh, you would put a transverse connector in such type C injuries? So Ranjit, Ranjit has raised the hand. Uh, yes. So he could put. Uh, I could put three columns, yes. Yeah, I used to put, but then uh, I think I don't remember last time when did I put. So for type C, for me, it is not MI, it's open for me, type C. And I really yeah. fuse them because it's a ligamentous injury. I align the column, fuse the back, do anything, everything possible to maintain stability. For me, a transverse cut is one of the way to increase my rotational stability in the actual pull-out. Then one or two. Oh, one, or one or two. two. One. 
one one at the fracture site okay the, okay and okay. Uh, for fusion what do you do sir do you do a post awesome no no i use all the lamina possible i drill and burn all the facets i don't harvest any graft in these patients no adding okay. the mobility you got lots of graft from this because you have all the spinous muscles which you have which you exposed i shingle them all use that bone okay okay sahil uh, let's conclude yeah so yep. uh, this is pretty much it i have uh, presented my case now i think the take home message is that uh, in in type c injuries long segment fixation is uh, the way to go forward and uh, um, in uh, injuries like these if it is a incomplete spinal cord injury you have to use reduction screws in the upper segments and try to manipulate carefully slowly distracting and uh, pulling these uh, uh, using all the reduction maneuvers possibly doing a facet resection or a um, short, uh, shortening the column if you're not able to achieve and if you have to do more distraction and if it is an asia a then you can do whatever maneuver you are comfortable with and the end aim is to have a completely aligned uh, spine uh, with a patent canal if possible thank you thank, thank you. you dr sahil that's uh, all dr guru i think there should be one in interesting comment from dr ajay shetty because he has published recently that even in type c injuries you don't need to fuse he has published that even type c injuries you don't need to fuse you can just stabilize and you are increasing uh, in x and outcome basically basically because in any fracture see the concept if you take you said about mis fixation if you take in 2000 people never used to do mis fixation because they always used to say in all fractures fusion like any fracture you have to fuse it but with the advent of mis screws now people do mis fixation there are publications of mis fixations in ankylosing spondylitis in type c injuries also the same principle we have never been fusing for more than 20 years and uh, we are not faced implant failures basically because you need to have a stable fixation aligned fixation the fracture heals soft tissue seals without any major issues you mean so, the anterior column heals the anterior, anterior column will heal if you have a stable fixation okay uh, so thank you thank you sahil you can unshare uh right okay uh, i would uh, request uh, dr ajay shetty the um, past secretary of uh, assi and chair education committee to conclude the session <clears throat> and so it has been wonderful session uh, so go to you sir uh good thank you guru at the outset my thanks to both the assi uh, for giving this opportunity and for the bss dr Sh professor shalam and all the faculty members for taking time at the end of the day to be with us i would like to thank my co faculty professor chabra ranjit and uh, the coordinators guru and all the faculty from the bss for being with us it was an interesting session and this will be relayed uh, during the asicon in mumbai and we will be sharing the details with the members of the bss thank you all again and good night thank you and we thank you thank you we hope to see you all sir sir Bye. and happy new thank year you. thank you very much thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you all thank you. see you in asicon yes. asicon right okay. see you in asicon thank you uh, rishi you can end the meeting dhanyawad thank you ಧಾರಾಳ ಕ್ಷೇತ್ರ ಧಾರಾಳ ರಸ್ತೆ ಸರಿ